Oh no. Not you, Grace. This is no time to be playing doctors and nurses. It's no good talking to her. She's possessed. You. You took my things. Where are they? They're not your things anymore. Pretty soon everything round here is going to belong to Liam again. Again? What's he been telling you? When he gets his podcast back from you, I'm going to be rich. And you believe him? Why shouldn't I? And I suppose he neglected to tell you that there won't be any place left to spend your money. Which is why we have no time left to waste. But time to change! I always dress for the occasion. Well, I'm glad to see that you are aware of the gravity in the situation. I never liked this podcast, Rob. Well, that's good, because any minute now it'll cease to exist. What's the time? Time enough for me to get my podcast, get out of here and take Lee with me. Lee is the co-host I've always yearned for. Oh, please. Lee! This is my podcast, this is my eye, and I'm in my own body. Liam's run out of ideas and now he plans to steal mine. That's the truth. Look at Grace. She's possessed by evil, not goodness. Grace, put it on him. I suspect you know how. (coughs) This won't hurt much. Rants for the occasion. Rob. Rob! What? Oh, Liam, I was having the weirdest dream. You fell asleep, you idiot. It's time to record our hundredth podcast. All right. And you know what, Liam? It's about time. is Cloister Bell. Imminent disaster. The Cloister Bell? Yes. What's that? Well, it's a sort of communications device reserved for wild catastrophes and sudden calls to man the battle stations. That's the Cloister Bell. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really terribly significant. The Cloister Bell? Oh, no. Oh, sorry about that, Liam. Just nodded off there. It's all right. It happens. But uh, as long as you're raring to go for the podcast. Yep, as ever. Um, hello everyone, welcome to the 100th episode of Cloyster Bell Podcast. As ever, Liam's here. Hi everyone. Hi Rob. Hi yeah. And we're joined by two special people today. We've got Matt. Hello there. And we've got Mark. Hello. So, how are you doing? Are you happy to be here for the special I am episode? I honoured to be here. This is... Um... It's amazing. I listen to every episode, so yeah, it's really cool oh. to be on. It's nice to be here again. Yeah, we had a <laughs> rehearsal the other night, didn't we, Matt? Yeah, a full two and a half hour rehearsal <laughs> where we just deleted the audio immediately after. Yeah, what? we should have kept that and used it. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit <laughs> He's a perfectionist. He wanted to go again. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting a strong sense of deja vu. <laughs> um, so what we got to drink tonight? I think we just spoke about it before. I'm on the the jam, jammy red wine, whatever that is. Nice. I'm sure Julie Golden's uh, drunk plenty of that in her time. Um, what are you on, Mark? Well, I've you? just had um a mug of PG Tips with milk and no sugar, and I'm just washing that down with a, a glass of Corev, um, which is a Cornish lager. Ooh. What about yourself, Matt? Giant mug of coffee. Giant mug. I know it's the giant mug. Is that particular mug to uh, to wind up the two Newcastle boys? Yeah. <laughs> Never for, let for the, the listeners. sports direct legacy die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate that company. Uh, yes, well, I'm having a lovely glass of water. Oh, nice. Refreshing. Mm. You could dunk some pretty big things in that mug. <laughs> <laughs> you get a whole donut in there. I I, I tell people you're my friend, Rob. And oh. Don't make me out to be a liar. 
<laughs> I'm very much anti dunking. Dunking biscuits, and in particular Rob Jaffa cakes. I know that's your favourite. Oh. Is the most abhorrent behaviour. Well, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but where do you stand on dunking like Mars bars and things? No, no, tea is sacros- sacrosanct. We mustn't dunk anything in it. I think I just need to stop right there. <laughs> fall out. <laughs> I, why, why do you need all your food in liquid form? <laughs> <laughs> he's preparing for old age when he's got no teeth and just, yeah. everything just turns to sludge. I've got a beautiful smile. You've got a full set. I can see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so finally today we're talking about the TV movie, which has been a long time coming, hasn't it, Liam? It has. I, I'm getting the feeling that this this po- this specific podcast is cursed. Just the huge amount of delay of talking about the damn thing. Then we did it. Then it was erased. <laughs> it's cursed. It's like the missing yeah. episodes all over again. Yeah. Although is. we say this is our hundredth episode. Well, this is a reconstruction of the hundredth. So. <laughs> <laughs> With telly snaps. I think, I think we're at we, today. We did episode one hundred and eighty-three. With wow. bonus episodes, now we've passed two hundred. And I'm a little mm. bit sad we didn't acknowledge that because we are going to reach episode 200, but we've kind of already done it. Mm. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I take it the wine's nice then, Rob. <laughs> I'm a fan of red wine, but. What does it taste <laughs> of? It's beyond. It's not. It's sweet and tarty. It's like. It's like syrup that's gone bad. Oh. So the warning is when you said it said about serving it chilled on the label. That's a, yeah, that's strange. Did. You did pick the right bottle up because you've got a real mixture behind <laughs> oh, you. Yeah, like, got, could have been the red wine. Could have been. You sure you're metal, not drinking balsamic vinegar? <laughs> <laughs> Rob's on the balsamic. I'll nice. finish it, but yeah. <laughs> what, what was the description on the bottle again? It's a ripe and vibrant wine with explosive notes of raspberry, pomegran- pomegranate, why can I not say that word, and luscious cherry, excellent served chilled. Pairs well with steak and all fiery barbecue treats. Mm. Because they hide the taste of the wine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where did That's you acquire this from, sauce. Rob? It was free from the neighbour. Why do you think that is? <laughs> <laughs> Don't they just like me? <laughs> is is there any bad blood between you or uh, <laughs> there was a whole thing with your um your trampoline when it disappeared down the street Are they... oh, that was a different neighbor oh, okay. yeah, well, I haven't told right. them yet. yeah <laughs> yeah that was a fun day so uh, having already asked you this question in, in the doomed recording in the lost episode <laughs> why the tv movie episode 100 Cause for celebration, why the TV movie? There's so many stories for all the other Doctors, and if we're going to do the eighth Doctor's one and only story, of course, there's only one opportunity to do it. So we thought, we'll get it right rather than doing it randomly one week with no preparation. Yeah. What about, what do you think, Liam? Yeah, well, that was pretty much it. It was sort of, we wanted to mark the fact that we were on our 100th uh, podcast and it just seemed it was sort of we either do the TV movie you know talk about the the, the one-off full adventure that Paul McGann has maybe a possibility of doing one of the Peter Cushing Dalek movies mm-hmm. but um, when we discussed it we thought well it just seemed to be the TV movie for, for us just seemed to be the obvious choice it sounds like you planned it that's uh it's an... It's very different from how we do things. We yeah. just and uh, also Mark. Yeah, it is the anniversary of the TV movie as well. That's right. Yeah. Yes. When, when we that. did our rehearsal the other night, mm-hmm. it was the world premiere anniversary when it first aired in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, but the UK premiere um, is coming up in a few weeks. I think we'll celebrate that by releasing it then. That sounds like a plan. Yeah. I think, don't I remember, unless the memory is cheating, didn't they release it on VHS before it was actually broadcast on BBC? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Midnight launches at HMVs and things. That's right. Yeah. 
it was because uh, again in our doomed recording we, one of the things we were talking <laughs> about was uh, our memories of watching it and uh, the tv movie and then the expectation leading up to it and i mm-hmm. remember um it was either a week or possibly a fortnight but i think a week before it was broadcast going into mm-hmm. hmv and it was just wall to wall of vhs yeah. of the tv movie and that thing of going oh i could i could watch it now do i buy yeah. it now and i remember b- being with, uh, with my father at the time and he's uh, and he was right he went no 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 part of the fun is you know wading up to the ex- mm-hmm. you know let the expectation build you're watching yeah. it at the same time that everyone else would be watching it mm-hmm. um and then you, you can get it on B- vhs afterwards um, sounds like a very wise man uh he had his moments i'll say <laughs> <laughs> Now and again, but yes, he, he was completely right. But yeah, I remember that uh, that opportunity of, of buying it before you could actually see the TV mm. uh, broadcast. It was sort of our generation's equivalent of the Target novelization of the Five Doctors being available before that was <laughs> yeah. broadcast. Be interesting being able to like queue for things because we, we just don't do that anymore. Mm. I used to, I used to go queuing for consoles or new releases and things. Mm-hmm. Those was, days are gone now. Was uh, I mean, it was probably. I mean, it was definitely pre-internet. But was there any spoilers or anything released, or was it just quite simply you can buy it or you can wait and watch it? Yeah, I think it was pretty. That was pretty much it. There was a build-up. I mean, because uh, I've still got the sixteen-page pull-out Radio Time souvenir. Um. So the only mm-hmm. thing that we sort of had at the time were you know some journalists going over to america and, and interviewing the key players so they you know getting what paul mcgann was saying mm-hmm. um which was he pretty much was terrified about going to conventions afterwards <laughs> seemed to be his big his big concern he had sylvester mccoy talking about how much fun uh, he was having and getting on with uh, the makeup artists on it sylvester did his uh, video diaries didn't he yes oh, yeah yeah, yeah. uh-huh I um I wasn't aware of that at the time, but I think that came out on VHS around about the same time as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but then th- 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 there was the whole thing about you know tying. It. This was you know, Doctor Who coming back, but there was a big tie up to, um, you know the the history of the show again. So with this souvenir, th- th- um, you had a breakdown of every single Doctor's era, and then for the Doctors that were alive at the time, uh. It- no, hang on, it wasn't all of them. It was sorry, it was uh, John Pertwee, Peter Davison, and Sylvester McCoy getting special little short interviews of their comments of what they thought about the TV movie and the fact that it was a joint American thing and getting their opinions on that. Mm-hmm. So I still got that. I treasure it still. That's good. Shooting it the other day it was quite good fun. Mark, what are your memories of the promotion, anticipation, and watching the movie? Um, I think, as, as somebody mentioned just now, it was pre-internet, so you didn't get quite so bombarded with that constant build-up of information drip feeding through, <clears throat> which, in a way, was quite nice. Um, I think I probably first started to get excited when they started to drop the trailers on BBC One. So I think it's the first time they'd used the that sort of slogan, he's back and it's about time. And you had the um, the trailer with the things like Stonehenge and um, Houses of Parliament all being sort of warped and stretched. Mm-hmm. And it all seemed very exciting, um, considering most of us, had, of my generation at least, had been watching things like Survival, which the effects were perhaps not necessarily as good. So, um, yeah, you could see there was a marked difference in that many years later were you still quite fond of the show back then yeah i don't i did have a moment i had a bit of a wobble during sylvester's early period um my interest had started to wane because i was getting to that sort of age so what would i have been so he took over in 87 didn't he so i would have been 14 then so that's where you want to be a teenager and you want to try and be a bit more cool and uh, your thoughts sort of turn to other mm-hmm. things. So um, if the show from a certain perspective seems to go slightly more to a, a lower age group, 
um, you perhaps kind of start to distance yourself. And I found it a bit embarrassing to watch. I kind of got to the point where I couldn't actually watch it with the rest of the family. I'd have to go off and watch it in another room. It was like a sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it was, I fell out of favor with it for a while. And then I think it was um, really when they came back with season 25 and Remembrance and watching that thinking, wow, they are really, they've hit the ground running here. I definitely just bought straight back into it from that point. There's still a few wobbles along the way. It's Doctor yeah. Who, but it still um, is. yeah, yeah, but yeah, that that got me back on track. So yeah, I don't think I'd ever given up hope altogether that it would come back. But uh, yeah, they the way they kind of ended the the original run, they didn't really say well, that's the end. They kind of just said it's being rested, mm-hmm. without saying when it would come back. So there was always that hope there. Do you have any memories of sitting down on the night to watch it? Ooh, um, yeah, I think I, I don't, you know, it's not something that's etched into my brain, but uh, I would have definitely have sat down and watched it on broadcast because it was a, a big deal. And uh, I remember quite enjoying it. What, what time of day did it, well, of night did it air? Because my recollection is I, I remember it being quite late and dark, like, when I, I I mentioned last time we spoke that the the ending that climactic scene with the eye of harmony is mm-hmm. the bit I can really vividly remember, and I I can remember being in my childhood bedroom and like the TV lighting the room up with special effects. Mm-hmm. Was it a late late showing? It definitely felt late evening for me. I don't know. I might, That's probably because you were all about, about three years old block. at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. I, th- I think I, Sadly, I was like, um, a little bit older remember. than that. But you remembered it quite differently, Matt, didn't you? It was more like... Yeah. You, you I, remember it being some big Raiders of the Lost Ark spectacle. At yeah. The end. Like, so, like I say, I would have been 10 at the time, I think. Yeah, 10. And I, I Jesus, remember I the build-up and... You know, British sci-fi wasn't at its best, you know, in the mid-90s. And I remember I was aware of what, well, kind of what Doctor Who was. I didn't really know the ins and outs of the character and the stories. But I I just remember they made it feel blockbuster. It felt big. And like I say, it was only when I've watched it through adult eyes, that end scene, you work out it's basically four people in a church. But to me, <laughs> I, I said the other night, it reminded me of the end of Ghostbusters. To me, when you saw mm. everything warping and coming in, it, it felt huge. And I, I really vividly remember Grace with her like blacked out eyes and mm. thinking, Christ, this is, this is good. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'd make that judgment now. <laughs> you know, I, I I remember enjoying it at the time. That's one of the things, like Doctor Who through the eyes of a child. Yeah. It must be quite good. Well, I was in my early 20s when it was broadcast, so um, I've probably got a slightly different perspective. I, in order to get my fix, because there was no Doctor Who, they had been showing things like X-Files on BBC Two. So that was quite a staple. And to my eyes, at least, possibly because it was also shot in Canada, uh, as X-Files was at the time, it very much felt like it was competing on a similar sort of level to X-Files, which Mm. was a big deal at the time because... I was actually going to mention that because Mm. it was more more on par with um, visually how X-Files and other shows looked like compared to like British shows. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looked a lot more, uh, it just looked much more lush when you looked at it on screen. The cinematography just looked mm-hmm. so much better than anything we'd seen before. Yeah, it still holds up. The The visuals, mm. the, the don't look particularly dated. Paul's wig is, um, <laughs> you know, it's not aged well, but... It's a it special, a lot special about effect. That. You know the story about that, I take it. So they, they signed him up, they were very much hoping for the Byronic sort of uh gen- gentleman the casting because of the hair <laughs> yeah yeah uh and then he'd been doing 
another show prior to that where he'd had a buzz cut rather not too dissimilar from uh, Christopher Eccleston. So when he turned up with that, they were somewhat surprised. So they ended up having to order this wig, which hmm, wasn't the most convincing. But um, did I read somewhere did that wig cost? Was it five thousand pounds? It was five thousand five hundred. Wow. I'd have to check, but I'm, I'm certain. You, we, you look it up, look up wigs. Yeah, I'm, c- <laughs> I'm certain when we covered it, it, it I'll have to Google it. Yeah. Can you give me the I prices remember, while you're looking, Matt? Just you know, yeah. for no particular reason. Uh... <laughs> I, I was reading a, a memory from Paul McGann, and he said, according to him, there was one day on the set, he had his wig off, uh-huh. and he sat down next to Eric Roberts, and apparently didn't know who he was, and he was chatting to him. <laughs> Doesn't entirely surprise me. <laughs> Eric Roberts, from the stories you hear, can, sounds like uh, he could be a little bit eccentric in a good way. Yeah. yeah. So while Matt's looking up some prices for the wigs, <laughs> um, we'll <laughs> do a quick summary of what's coming up. Sorry, it costs 5000 US dollars. Holy guacamole. What's that in um, 2022 dollars? <laughs> He's a science teacher, not a maths teacher. Come on, give him a break. So yeah, coming up, we're going to talk about the beginning of the story, look at the cast and crew, and talk about some of the key elements of the story, like the regeneration, the seventh and eighth doctors, respectively. We're going to talk about the kiss. Then we're going to have a bit of a break while Harry and Luke come on for a little while. Who? Matt, you missed your opportunity to have a yawn then. <laughs> Sorry, um, I don't I mean to interrupt, off. but in today's money, that wig would have cost $9,213. 84.3% inflation. Good, Good God. <laughs> <laughs> money well spent. Mm-mm. Well, it's a talking point. <laughs> <laughs> it costs three times as much as my car. Wow. So that's that's really silenced the conversation. Everyone's <laughs> dumbfounded. What about if you're on a budget and you want a cheap wig? Just a cat. <laughs> Just a cat. I'm sure Anthony Ainley had a spare one knocking around somewhere. Uh, I, I love everything about him. That's why I brought him up. Yeah, is it, what is is it, it what, Matt, what is so special about Anthony Ainley? Can you distill it into a sentence? Uh, he's the most handsome man I was unaware of. Y- you know when you watch like a teenage romance rom com mm-hmm. film, uh, and the the captain of the football team finally sees the inner beauty of the new uh-huh. kid. She takes her glasses off. And she, that is the way I first looked at Anthony. And I was just like. Who is that? We are talking about Anthony Ainley, who played the master, yeah? Oh, okay, right, okay. Yeah. He's, <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he's aggressively mm. handsome. Like, his handsomeness attacks you. If you had to pick a favourite look for him, would it be... Because um, I'm not sure how many of those his you've seen, because you've got some real treats coming up. What uh, have you seen? I, I've seen him in The Five Doctors... And what was the recent one we watched? Mark of the Rani. Yeah. It, honestly, love at first sight. That wasn't the answer I was expecting. Well, you, you've got some absolute treats coming up because some of his disguises are uh, pretty impressive. The King's Demons and Time Flight in particular. Yeah, <laughs> King's Demons was the one that was going through my yeah. mind. But uh, we won't spoil it for Matt because he's got all that to come. Yeah. yeah all yeah. in good time. So... We we kind of had a bit planned where we'd do the the plot for the TV movie, and we kind of improvised mm. it last time. I think I did. Or did we do that? Did we talk through the plot? How how would you summarise the plot in one minute, Liam? Um, the Seventh Doctor is forced to land in San Francisco because the Master, who is a uh, snake, uh, has disabled the TARDIS. Uh, and uh, in San Francisco, he takes over... Eric Roberts. Um, the Doctor, in order to fix the TARDIS, has to have a 
steal a piece of a um, very advanced clock as if, as we are about to enter the millennium. Uh, but he's been shot by a random gang who decides to hang around back alleys just randomly with guns. They shoot the Seventh Doctor. He regenerates, um, be- uh, befriends the surgeon who actually killed him, Dr. Grace Holloway. They end up... Um, hang on. The, but the, uh, I'm losing track of this now. Yeah, I sorry. Up <gasps> now. That was a pretty valiant just effort. A minute. That sums it up well. That's way better than I could have managed. Do we know about the genesis of the whole story how it came to be made because that's like a story within itself oh, I, I, I feel like you prepared something for that well not exactly but um there's a really <laughs> if, you, if you've got the i think it's on the special edition dvd and probably on the blu-ray as well there's been about 300 different releases of this one um there's a really great documentary called the seven year hitch if you haven't seen that it's really worth checking out but yeah, with after the show kind of ended, you had a, a period where nothing much was going on and uh, it was approaching the 30th anniversary. So the BBC is just this huge corporation and there are all these various divisions within it. So although you had the BBC programmes department who were responsible for making programmes, you also had BBC Worldwide who were the people who did all the sort of um, the selling of the programs abroad and also organising things like VHS releases and that, so they were like the commercial arm. So they decided, independently of the programmes unit, that they would come up with an idea for the 30th anniversary. And the, the story they came up with was called Doctor Who in the Dark Dimension. Have you heard of this? Mm-hmm. Yes, I Matt's have. shaking his uh, head. Yeah, it would have had, I think, the Cyberman in it, and it would have been directed by Graham Harper. That's right. And they were going to yeah. bring back Tom Baker as the main Doctor. They were going to have multiple Doctors, but Tom Baker was going to be the the main man. Was there a concept for the Cyberman in that? Looking yes. Quite, yeah. Looking quite demonic. Yeah. There's there's photos online of that. Hmm. So um, yes, yeah, so they they decided to to come up with that, and um, they would start to get quite a bit of steam in terms of getting scripts and everything done, and they were looking to book time to start filming. Um, But while that's going on, simultaneously, there's a guy called Philip Siegel, who is, um, he was born in the UK, and then he emigrated to the States. And he, I think, had watched Doctor Who from day one, and was obsessed with the show. And he was working for Amblin Entertainment. Um, So he had been very keen to resurrect the show and he had uh, been trying to get Steven Spielberg interested in bringing it back so he had got the ball rolling and they'd done all these various designs and CGI effects for new look Daleks and things like that and uh, they'd invited the execs from the BBC over to have a look at it and uh, they just happened to have Steven Spielberg on set they were talking taking them through all the the massive sound stages they had there so they did a really big sales pitch on it and it all sounded like it was going pretty well Um, and that really put the kibosh on the dark dimension so I think Philip Seagull Seagull had the uh, the idea that he wanted to go ahead with it so he effectively killed off the dark dimension from happening and um then unfortunately amblin then decided to pull out and he moved to another studio so he had a connection with someone at fox if my memory serves rightly um, who was responsible for doing their tv movies so although they couldn't organize a new series he was hopeful that if they were able to pull off a tv movie they could use it as a backdoor pilot to make a new series and they had all these weird and wonderful ideas of where they were going to go with the series if it came to that so they're talking about the doctor going on some sort of massive mission to try and find his father it was going to be like an odyssey sort of thing and they've written this whole bible about the sort of backstory of the doctor and all this kind of stuff um so that really didn't come to pass because probably jumping the gun here a bit but as you probably have gathered 
poor old Paul didn't really make another appearance until Night of the Doctor. No. Um, am I right in thinking there was some kind of Seagal master plan? That's the kind of a phrase I hear <laughs> yeah. floating around, but I don't know if people are more in the loop than me and there's more, mm-hmm. there's more to know. Yeah, I... there was all sorts of stuff going on about where they were going to go with it. Because mm. there the, the were... Um... When it was with initially with Amberlin, there were there mm. were um, two main um, scripts that were prepared. Were prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one, if I remember rightly, Mark was um, it, apparently it was quite similar in tone and feel to the Indiana Jones movies, and Steven Spielberg had saw that script and went, "Well, that's very similar to something that I've mm. already been linked with in the past. I'm not keen uh-huh. on it." And that was so that was junked on that basis. Yeah. So then they got another writer to provide another script. Um, but then Philip Siegel wasn't particularly keen on that. But mm-hmm. from what I can understand, the one thing that seems to continue through all these different uh, ideas is that uh, the Doctor's father, a chap called Ulysses, mm-hmm. uh, went missing. And the idea was that if this were to have gone on to a full series, part of the story would have been the Doctor looking for his lost father. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, absolutely nailed it. Um, but then Fox made the genius decision to air the TV movie in the States against the last ever episode of the very popular sitcom Roseanne. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, uh, as successful as it was in the UK, I think it got really good ratings in the UK mm-hmm. um, because it had not set the uh, the networks alight in the US. Mm. That was it for for the Fox version of it. Sadly, hmm. but the show is probably in a stronger place now than it may than it maybe would have been. Yeah, I think I think RTD learned a lot from watching the TV movie and what what does work and what doesn't work. Did you hear about some of the the casting choices that they were considering before they settled on Paul McGann? No. So yeah, there were a few names in the hat. Um, there is a slightly cringy video circulating i think it's on youtube of tony slattery who was on um <laughs> channel four on a a game show um called whose line is it anyway he was quite a big name at the time in the 90s mm-hmm. and he auditioned for it and there's a video of him watching it back now as he is now and just thoroughly cringing watching himself <laughs> doing this uh uh rendition of the the script they've given him and it's um yeah, John Sessions was also another name that was bandied about, but the the favourite before they settled on Paul McGann was Liam Cunningham, who, if you've watched Game of Thrones, is probably best known to you as Lord. Uh, was he Davos? Davos Seaworth, yeah. So yeah, he was in the frame. Is it weird to say that I've never seen Game of Thrones? Well, he's he's later in Doctor Who, isn't he? Yeah. It? Is it Silence in the Library? Uh, he was in, I think he was in Cold War, wasn't he? Uh, that, yeah. The it, submarine one. That's yeah. the one. I yeah. can't remember who I'm thinking of. Mm. But yeah, I, I yeah. remember when we got to that episode, David. Because mm-hmm. I, I know as well, there's a really, really good YouTube channel that I've dipped into whenever we've done classic Doctor Story. Uh-huh. I think it's called Clever Dick Films. Oh, right. He, he's released Doctor by Doctor, a little video sort of summarising their period on the show. But the one that covers the McGann movie and the Eccleston era, where you see where the show was when it was absolutely just dead in the water, they're they're my two favourite episodes because he talks Mm. right through kind of the background of the show. Uh And, you know, it was just something that I had no knowledge of at all mm. and in a way it's kind of a miracle that we are where <laughs> we are yeah because the bbc didn't want sylvester mccoy in the in it at all did they to begin with mm-hmm. um and then they kind of demurred and said well he can be in it as long as he's not in it for very long and as long as he doesn't say very much which i think is a bit <laughs> harsh on him <laughs> it's yeah, one of his it best performances actually yeah, mm, but I mean, really I think it's it. very safe to say that uh, BBC Enterprises loved Doctor Who because it brought mm. in the money, but yeah, yeah. the BBC itself just regarded mm. it as an absolute embarrassment and hated it. Yeah. 
Um, apart from, I think, Alan Yentop, who was... Was he commissioner of the BBC? I've forgotten what the job title was now, but uh, he seemed to recognise mm-hmm. the importance of Doctor Who and was the chap who seemed to be um, supporting it. it. Yeah, yeah, championing it, yeah, internally. But uh, yeah, so when Philip Siegel said, well, because he wanted to do it properly, so bring the old Doctor yeah. back and actually have the regeneration. And mm-hmm. the, yeah, as you say, Mark, the, the, the BBC kind of like, well, we don't want to because the Sylvester McCoy era and he was crap. I disagree, of course, but that was yeah. basically what they... That, that's I think it's just said. that association with the show ending, I guess. And, mm-hmm. But uh, no, I think he was really good in it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, he seems to... I mean, I always thought that um, the Seventh Doctor being incredibly manipulative has been overplayed. I mean, yeah, that that was a big part of his uh, interpretation and performance of it, but I think it was a bit more nuanced than that. Yeah, um, I think they kind of ran with it with the New Adventures books, didn't they? Mm. They kind of really emphasised it, whereas I don't think it was quite so in your face on the telly. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the, briefly, when he's in the TV uh, in the TV movie, uh, he seems to be a mu- uh, just much more comfortable in his own own skin mm. and a bit more relaxed. Yeah, you know, um, you know, just quite happy. Just you know, the, the sort of Doctor who's yes, he's quite happy going on adventures, but also quite happy just to sit sit in his armchair reading the time machine mm-hmm. and eating eating jelly babies from a bowl. Now, now you mentioned that scene. Mm-hmm. I think I remember us talking about this on the Blue Box podcast many, many, many years ago now, and I remember someone making a very valid point, which was for us fans, it was just amazing to see the TARDIS flying through space and then you see this wonderful gothic interior. Mm -hmm. But for someone who'd never seen the show before, what can you imagine would be going through their mind? You see this blue box spinning through space and then it just cuts to some guy sitting in a castle. (laughs) There's no... (laughs) Yeah, that is... If you don't know the history of the show, you've got Mm -hmm. no idea what's going on. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Having watched this as a child, I was probably more forgiving, you know, like, I'm just here for the adventure. But uh-huh. When we watched it recently, <laughs> mm. it, it, you know, we talked about it the other night. Like, it's kind of inaccessible to new viewers. Mm. It's not what fans of the show are used to. <laughs> it's just this weird Frankenstein of a bit of both. And yeah, you're right. I mean, we, we had the whole reveal of the TARDIS being smaller on the outside bigger on the inside mm-hmm. with chang lee yeah. and that scene was perfect but yeah. it comes way too late mm-hmm. and you have yeah, the, I, the cop on the motorbike as well which is a cool scene yeah <laughs> yeah i love that bit <laughs> but yeah funny enough uh, on this okay because i've always you know, always just accepted it but that's actually a really good point point. and actually on this occasion when i was watching the tv movie i was aware that i think structurally it is a bit odd I think it's probably uh, the polite way of putting it. I think because you start off with um, clearly what is supposed to be a science fiction series, space, uh, rob- robotic robotic voices off screen, someone being disseminated, uh, title sequence all in space and everything like that. And then we cut to uh, San Francisco uh, street gang fights, mm-hmm. um, and then it seems to cut into some sort of medical drama. Yeah. And I think actually had 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 it been structured in a way where it be, it begins like that. It's a bit like you know how with an earthly child, the very first episode, it begins just like a normal drama. You yeah. just think it's a, a straightforward mm-hmm. drama, a bit of a mystery and finding out, and then it just completely um turns itself around completely yeah. when as soon as you go into the TARDIS and it's like, what the hell is this? And then mm. it's this, this mad science fiction series and i think at the time because american television was proven to be incredibly popular so if you were going to bring something like doctor who back as odd as it may seem now but at the time it was like well american television's the big thing if you are going to bring back this property you know bring it back as as an american Mm co-production with plenty of money thrown at it and one of the big things that you know medical dramas in general were quite popular you know so you had er and yeah. obviously had Casualty, which the BBC were broadcasting mm-hmm. anyway. So I think that if the TV movie had been structured initially like that, and then you bring in the science fiction element of like having Chang Lee coming across the TARDIS and doing the whole walk around, and uh-huh. it, it could have been, maybe that would have been a much better way of yeah. easing people in. 
I've never put this much thought into it. I really just <laughs> they really just overload the viewers with a load of nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's it. If you think about the first forty five seconds, mm. you've got Pagan his voice. There's over, a prolo- where, where, yeah. you know, I am the doctor, my enemy is the master, he was on mm. trial from the Daleks, we're going to Gallifrey. <laughs> and as a child, you must be thinking what? What is any of this? <laughs> like, but then, as an adult with a knowledge of a show, yeah. I I listen to it and I just wait, wait a minute, none, <laughs> none of this makes any sense. Like that, that that's the you know the balancing act mm. I think they had to do, and I don't, I don't. I think the scales are level, but I think yeah. they're not. I think where they, they really. Be. I feel like they overloaded it with a lot of. <laughs> fan service kind of references to old mm. stuff and you know it's this a certain part of me the nerdy part that's like oh yeah look they've got the sonic screwdriver they've got this they've got that mm. but yeah i just mm. as i said before i think rtd mm. when he came to make the revived series i think he must have looked at that and thought well that's really worked maybe drop some of the the continuity because it really I know we're getting a bit ahead now, but he really kind of just did a almost like a reset, really, and just didn't mm, want to hark back to all the old stuff. Even though we we're looking for all the fan service and the continuity stuff. Oh, of course, yeah. At the time, we thought there wasn't enough of it. Yeah. And it, it did get to the point where maybe in the Capaldi era, or it was a bit continuity mm. heavy, or it, yeah. it relied on, an, on like a working knowledge of the past. It was very much for the fans, wasn't it? Rather yeah. than the general audience. Which is fine by me, but yeah, you can imagine yeah. your average person tuning in may not necessarily have uh, found it quite so entertaining. So, I, I remember when David and I watched, it's one of David Tennant's finales, I can't remember which one, and it's at the ending where the Doctor screams Rassilon. And as I was watching that with David, he was kind of like looking at me as if like, it's Rassilon. I had no idea who that was, what was going on or anything. I was just say, it's Timothy Dalton, isn't it? <laughs> Spitting across the screen, yeah. It was, it was funny because when that was broadcast, um, I had a, fr- uh, a friend of mine who liked Doctor Who but wasn't a massive fan, and he got into the show through the new era. Mm-hmm. And we met up not long after that was broadcast. And obviously me being a long-time fan, I was like, the Time Lords are back. Isn't that fantastic? And he is, I thought his reaction was interesting. He went, no, I think that's actually a mistake. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was like, why? And he went, I can't really explain why. I just, he just felt it, it robbed the mystery of the show. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting from the perspective of someone who just liked it and got into it since it came back and mm-hmm. was really enjoying the David Tennant run. When it came to that, his initial reaction was, mm, I'm not keen on this. And that did make that did give me pause for thought because initially, yeah. I mean, one because I'm a James Bond fan as well, and Timothy Dalton's my favourite Bond, so I was, mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ridiculously overly excited. It's a time notes, and it's James Bond. Wow! Yeah. Um, but that yeah, was such a cool and bizarre moment when his head just appeared on screen. Yeah, <laughs> and then obviously just the, the angle, just see him spit it. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With um, going back to the TV movie. The whole re- regeneration and McCoy's death is it's quite horrific. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of, of all the, the deaths, it's, um, yeah, when you watch it back, it's, yeah, it's quite disconcerting to watch, I find. We talked about this again in the uh, in the, uh, the Forever Lost the recording. In the, yeah, sorry, in the dress <laughs> rehearsal of this podcast. Um, one of the things I always remember was that when this was first broadcast, when Chang Li uh, just before the, the TARDIS lands and he's with his friends and mm-hmm. uh, there's the gang who he's been running off from and his friends get shot. But the way that that was, I always thought that that was a bit odd because they seem to be standing there one moment and then the next that they're not. And then Chang Li seems to have basically jumped from one side of this yard that they're into the other and then the TARDIS lands. I always thought it was a bit disjointed. Mm. It wasn't until many years later that I realised that the BBC originally had chopped that up because yeah. this was only a few months after the Dunblane massacre. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was very on the nose, as it were, when it when it was yeah. originally broadcast. So when mm-hmm. when it was released on DVD, that was when we had the TV movie completely unedited. So yeah. then 
the way that I can completely understand why the BBC made that decision back in 96. Oh, yeah. And I think it was the right decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but then seeing it completely uncut, the, the, the choreography of, of the scene, if I can put it like that, makes much more sense. But then there was the yeah. other thing as well. When it comes to the operation, uh, when the, uh, during the operation, when yeah. the seventh doctor dies, mm-hmm. I hadn't realized that there was stuff that had been tr- uh, edited out of that as well. I never mm-hmm. realized that Sylvester McCoy, you know, actually screams yeah. in agony before then he yeah. collapses. Did you find that quite distressing, Mark? The scream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know. What did you find it a bit funny? It's not necessarily, it's not necessarily my favorite doctor. But you kind of got attached to him because you'd seen him for all these years. And, you know, you want him to go out in a heroic way. But that was just such a really sad way for him to go. If you were in the test audience, do you think you'd want that scene cut? (laughs) Oh, well, I mean, what do I know? (laughs) These people have paid thousands to make these sorts of choices. So they obviously know what they're doing. Later on tonight, um, after the recording, we're going to sit down and have tea and biscuits in the cloister room oh which nice is a little bonus episode matt's gonna join us would you like to have tea and biscuits later on mark if you've got time of course yeah i'd love to cool all right well, well then, if they've not all been snaffled already i mean is there much left uh, in the biscuit tin they're all absolutely sodden oh see i don't yeah. mind donkey biscuit but pre-dunked biscuits oh yeah. no no <laughs> I'm oh, adding it down to the co-op. Point that hasn't been tapped into yet. <laughs> yeah. I'll just pop down just to the big, co-op and get myself a fresh packet. Big plate of wet sand. <laughs> biscuits. Mm, yum. Are you too busy oh. in this day and age? Then how about pre dunked <laughs> custard creeps? <laughs> well, Harry from Who Can Convince You seems to think that rich tea is the best biscuit, but then that's obviously No, that's madness. the worst. Yeah. It, exactly. I think they go... Yeah, they, they soak up too quick. Rich. No. Oh, you mean when you dunk or just in general? Just in well, general. Well, just in general, thing. but yeah, oh, I mean, right, they're okay. not the dunkable no. biscuit because they don't taste of anything. They, just, yeah. they go a bit soft if you dunk them for too long. No. Yeah. Triple no. them up. That's a good idea. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever joined one of these Skype calls or after shows <laughs> where it hasn't turned into talking about biscuits. <laughs> the Venn diagram of Doctor Who started versus this? biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Chris Chibnall knew what he was doing when he introduced the uh, the, the the biscuit thing on the. T- That's never come back, has it? No. The TARDIS console no. being able to dispense biscuits. Maybe they're saving it for the same. Maybe that, yeah, it's foreshadowing something yeah. big. Oh. Maybe she. Yeah. Maybe she, she chokes gets... to death on a. Uh, no, no. A cream. <laughs> no. Maybe she's Straight mortally wounded, she and the only thing that's going to save her is a custard cream. Oh. That triggers the regeneration. It all makes sense now. Yeah. And then the That's sale of Pickles to Creams skyrocket. Yeah. Did the sale of celery increase during the early 80s, do you think? <laughs> I mean, um, at least I went and bought out, bought some custard creams when it was a thing on Doctor Who, because uh, uh-huh. uh, I bought some custard creams, had a little photo shoot, photoshopped around it, and that was our podcast art that week. Nice. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I could have just Googled custard creams. That's because you're a professional, yeah. Rob. Yeah. yeah. Go that extra mile. Don't want to steal something. No, yeah. no. Um, so, yeah, if you want to hang out with us, with Teen Biscuits, it's actually a Patreon special. So, mm. you'll be, um, I don't know if you've ever been the star of pay per view content, <laughs> pay per listen, but uh, this well, is it's my OnlyFans channel. Um, it's very special, it's yeah. very niche. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. So we did a story breakdown. We'll have a look at the cast and crew. So, of course, Sylvester McCoy, who famous from Doctor Who. I'm not sure if if we, he's famous um... for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, in recent years, like franchises like Middle Earth stuff, he's in The Hobbit. Yeah. Um, he is going to be in the upcoming series of The Monsters. Mm-hmm. Wasn't he in Sense as well? I seem to remember. I think so. The memory cheats. I don't know what else. Paul McGann was in it. What's he been in? With Nell and I is my big thing for him. Yeah, that's a big one. With another sort of doctor. Yeah. Richard you think e. that's, you could kind of use your headcanon to say that is a Doctor Who multi doctor story. Oh, yeah. Just both got amnesia. And Uncle Monty is the master. 
That makes sense. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we should actually review it one one week with mm. the intention of viewing it that way. <laughs> yeah. and just analyze it. Really but as a joke, I had this thing with Rob where it didn't matter what it what it was. Any actor who's been in who's played the Doctor doesn't matter, and they're in something else. Yeah, that's Doctor Who canon. Mm-hmm. So yeah. John Hurt is the War Doctor in Alien and Midnight Express. <laughs> wow. <What? laughs> Makes sense. And in I Claudius. Wow. Yes. What a turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll that became the same oh, way yeah. again. And I Claudius also has Patrick Stewart in it. Yes. Yeah. And another version of the Master, of course. Derek Jacobi. Oh yes, of course. It was Tick of just yes, of course, Derek Jacobi, yeah. Yeah. And King Yukanos. Yes. Brian Blessed was once mm. a subtle actor. Believe yes. it, folks. It's he's there. really good in that. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. My, my friend bumped into Brian Blessed at a motorway service station, and he just said, "It's exactly how you expected it to be." <laughs> you know, like the whole services stopped to look at why this old man was shouting. <laughs> 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 you know? Of the, he was doing this tour and uh, part of the tour took him to Newcastle so I went right I'm going to see the legend that is Brian Blessed so mm. I went and you know obviously it was supposed to be a talk and there was going to be a question and answer session at the end uh-huh. uh, but he talked so much there wasn't actually any time for any questions at the end which was fine because we were all mm-hmm. thoroughly entertained but I think in my case it's probably just as well because I was gonna, <laughs> I was deliberately going to go obscure and everyone you know everyone be asking him about Flash Gordon or whatever I was yeah, going to ask yeah. him about the episode of Blake 7 he was in Ooh. so it's probably just as well there wasn't any time because I'd be like who cut. is this nutter <laughs> if you haven't heard it he was a guest on Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre yes. Podcast yes yes so yes. funny fantastic, fantastic. yeah mm-hmm. I don't think Richard Herring gets a word in edgeways the whole no, time <laughs> Were we doing the cast? Did we get as oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Carry on, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. One Paul McGann. Um, he was in Alien 3. Yeah. Even more so in the special edition. I am that weird person who actually likes Alien 3. I love it. Mm. Yeah. So that's Doctor Who canon. Carry on, Rob. Yeah. 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 What else has he been in? Luther. Was he? Yeah. Oh. He's quite a big part in that. Seems to remember he's uh, a love rival for Luther. Yeah, they're getting a few punch ups. And also, while we're on the uh, the casting, I think I remember his brother also went up for the part of the Doctor as well. We- yeah, I can't it? remember which one it is now. There's about five hundred McGanns, <laughs> and they're oh, all. Oh, he didn't know until a few years later. Yeah. Yeah. I think it could have been. Yeah. Yeah. We did say the other night that the McGanns are like rats, and he never made it <laughs> six foot away from one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they got it right by choosing Paul McGann. I think he's really good. Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry, Rob. Rattle through the rest of the categories. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, that first time we saw Paul McGann, Liam, was he, he was at the hotel reception, and I said, "Oh, we should shout over Perfume Ponce." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you dared me to do that. I just. <laughs> I since read that he gets that everywhere he goes. Uh, oh, does he? Oh, so I could have yeah. said it. He just he would have, he have said it. Yeah. All right, okay. I'll know that <laughs> next time. Yeah. So Daphne Ashbrook. Mm-hmm. I know her from the TV movie. Yeah, she's in that. Mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine. <laughs> All right. E.G. So. I know him from the TV movie. I remembered. Uh, I knew him from Stargate Atlantis. Oh wow! He was in a bit of that. Eric Roberts. Yes. I think we know him from everything. Mm. But I know him from the TV movie and that Batman movie he was in. Oh, yeah, that Batman movie. Yeah. He's in um, Grey's Anatomy at the moment. Okay. One of the, one of the characters' dads. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he was in Pretty Woman. Oh, no, that was his sister, wasn't it? Yeah, Julia Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> he was just wearing one of those wigs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah. the thigh-length boots. It's all the Swings same person. <laughs> Yeah, you never see them in the same room at the same time. Just saying. That, that's it for the main cast. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think the cast is good. Yeah. And weirdly, I think the performances are good. Mm-hmm. But, but somehow, I hear a but coming. Yeah, but somehow, I don't know. It, it, 
the, the phrase I used the other night, and I stand by it, is everybody involved in this, from production team, actors, directors, fans, everybody deserved better. And this, I can't put my finger on it. What doesn't work? Like, because I like it. I like all aspects of it. But I know it just isn't quite right. Well, with Eric Roberts, right, I, I, I like his performance. Uh, he's clearly having fun with a part, which, it, you know, it, I think is perfect. And he's got that balance of threatening and camp, which I just think, you know, so I absolutely love his performance. But when you look at the, um, I can't remember if it was through the production subtitles or through the making of documentary of this, but you find out that um, the idea was during the course of the film, the master... Uh, the body is clearly decaying. So the idea that obviously this was going to be through makeup. So that would, the only bit that we end up getting in the end result is the bit when the, uh, the fingernail comes off. But the whole idea was that uh, the master was clearly, the body was decaying and falling apart. So visually, uh, we also see the reason why the master would want to steal all the doctor's lives. But Eric Roberts, um, <laughs> through his vanity, uh, basically vetoed that entire idea. He didn't want any, you know, he didn't want any makeup to show that he was decaying or anything like that. So, uh, good actor to play the part, and I love his mm. performance. But yeah. it's just a shame that his vanity impacted, you know, a big narrative part of the story. That you scene with the fingernail has just has no meaning to it. Yeah, mm. it's like he's just like... trying to gross her out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mentioned the other night when we talked, instead of watching this, this time around, I read the Target novelization. Oh, and yeah. that body horror of the Doctor is far more prominent in there. Mm. In the end, he's almost like a being of just light. He's almost not a physical being because his body's decayed that much. And <laughs> yeah, that mm. that's not translated from the movie. <laughs> No, no, it's not. And yeah, and you hit on the nail, Rob. So with that, when he peels off, the, it is a gross moment, but that just looks like he's just doing that to gross out the uh, the receptionist who he's talking to. Mm. It doesn't it doesn't seem to have any other relevance to that. Which yeah. So, th you know, that's a shame. It takes a while for uh, McGann to, to get going when you consider this is... They don't know they're going to get a series, so this is their one and only chance to really show their doctor i can't remember how long it is before he actually gets his first appearance is it a good 20 minutes in something like that yeah i think so something like feels that. like that yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like we've already had him speak at the beginning yeah but that's yet another confusing thing for the for the new viewers it's yeah. like there's there's a voice of someone mm -hmm. who a young voice of an old man <laughs> <laughs> how do you draw the connection there yeah confusing mm. and they do like to um they go with the whole sort of christ imagery with when he resurrects and comes out of his uh place in the uh yeah. in the storage cupboard i do like the obviously because the company that made the uh the tv movie owned the rights to the old uh horror movies i like the fact that they intercut it with the uh frankenstein's monster being uh brought to life i thought that was very cool Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was cool as well. There's a bit, mm. you know, when the the Doctor regenerates and comes, it's a bit on the nose of going, he's alive, and then he's like, yeah, yeah. but it works, and I do mm. like it, but I also yeah. like the humour, so there's yeah. a bit, uh, I'm jumping ahead slightly, but that mm -hmm. whole thing of going, I don't think the second coming happens often, and then just the way that <laughs> that guy goes, do you think he's going to go to a better hospital? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that, it cracks me up. But the, even the bit when uh, when the Eighth Doctor, the first, the, basically the first thing he sees is someone fainting, and then he sees mm. a bit of Frankenstein of just yeah. going, you know, when the monster going, Urgh! and then the woman screaming her head off, and he yeah. kind of flinches, and then just goes, "I'm not up for this," and walks off. <laughs> <laughs> does make me laugh. I like that. Yeah, bit of foreshadowing for uh, the Tory government's treatment of the NHS as well, with the uh, the state of the hospital as well. Mm. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you think the humour's balanced well in this? I think the, it works fairly well. not much of it. There was a deleted scene, the whole thing about give him the gun, which oh, I think yeah. was a bit daft. Is that, when he's, that. What, what is that, that when he's talking to the motorcycle cop? Yeah, and yeah. Um, 
not give him the gun. It's give him the, give him the keys. So mm-hmm. basically, I, I think Grace is holding the gun at the police officer, and he's not handing over the keys. And then all of a sudden, all the bystanders simultaneously go, "Give him the keys." <laughs> It's a bit pantomime. Yeah. Which is a bit weird. A bit Hollywood cheese. Yeah, it feels like they were trying to work in a bit of Monty Python in there. I've completely mm. forgotten about that. Yeah. I'm pleased that was edited there. Isn't it? Yeah. So we've covered the regeneration a bit. Um, visually, it was quite good considering it was 96. We've yeah. got the whole thing of them twisting the faces around mm-hmm. and in emerge them. Yeah. So I think that, that effect was done quite well. And. It was certainly an improvement over uh, Colin into Sylvester, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although, ironically, Although the there was wig. another wig invi- <laughs> involved, so uh, <laughs> slightly more expensive one this time, though. Yeah, maybe that's uh, Philip Siegel, you know, having too many continuity. <laughs> I will even, I'll even check out the reference to the wig. Wow, that's a deep cut, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, visually it works. I mean, I think it's yeah. quite, yeah. you know, if, uh, Sylvester McCoy gurning for his life and then Paul McCoy mm. going, mm, I mean, I have to, but it works. And uh, it's, um, there's something about you visually get the fact that, you know, th- uh, the fact that someone's completely changing. So it's, it's skin mm. and bones are, um, you know, completely altering. I always get that sense when, when it comes yeah. to this regeneration. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. weren't McGann and McCoy mates prior mm. to, to this? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember how is they got right? to know each other. I think it was it through Ken Campbell or something like that. Because McCoy was in the Ken Campbell Roadshow, wasn't he? Which was this really mm-hmm. wacky, bizarre stage thing where he'd shove ferrets down his trousers and things like that. Yeah, I've, I've seen <laughs> pictures of that, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, and uh, hitting nails through his nose and stuff. In mm. fact, wasn't Ken Campbell uh, up for he the was. Doctor at some point? He was. But apparently his audition was so scary. He was a very bizarre man. My mm. wife went to see him in stand up once, and uh, yeah, I, she really enjoyed his humour, but he's really out there. Mm. There's a video going around, and I can't remember. It's been so long since I've seen it, but I think he was talking about how he had been speaking to this medium, and she had got in touch with Charlie Chaplin, and she said, is there anything you want to ask Charlie? And so he he asked her to ask Charlie, who is the greatest living actor? And so uh, she asked him the question, and Charlie comes back with Jackie Chan. <laughs> Bit of a left-field choice, but, I mean, I love Jackie Chan. Uh-huh. Don't get me wrong, but, um, yeah, it was a surprise. One of Charlie's favourites. Mm, yeah. Well, That's you know, a physical actor completely throws yeah, himself yeah. into the... Absolutely, <laughs> into the... Yeah. So, it yeah. makes sense. I can see there's a logic there. There is a logic there. Yeah, I can yeah. see. So you know, I can see Charlie Chaplin saying that. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Ken Campbell turns up in Faulty Towers as well, as one of um, right. as oh, one of yes. Sybil's friends when she's allegedly ill. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, let's get off that whole Ken Campbell thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do I think the Seventh Doctor compares? to older versions of him with visually he's got a new outfit yeah i'm glad down they ditched the um the vest with the yeah the winner's brave <sighs> <sighs> yeah i just think it works so much better yeah you think it works better in the movie i think so what about like his uh his latest seasons like how he looks in ghost light yeah i think it's i think that once he gets a darker coat that helps a lot and um, I think he jokes that he's because the hat was his own hat, and he joke he jokes that he only got the part because they wanted the hat, and he came with it. So. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's uh, I think he's definitely um, it's a bit easier on the eye in the TV movie. Mm-hmm. It's a bit too much on the nose. I really didn't like the whole thing with question marks everywhere, leaving business a, cards and things. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the umbrella though. Yeah. 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 But um I was watching um the making of season twenty four on the Blu ray box set. Oh, and yeah. The, yeah. And there's a bit on that where you see um the must it was when they were rehearsing Delta and the Bannerman. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's on location and there's a photograph of Sylvester McCoy in his costume, but he doesn't have the, the jumper on. He has everything uh-huh. else, but the jumper yeah. isn't on. It looks really, really good. Yeah. 
and just go, oh, that bloody jumper. Mm. It's like Colin in... Oh, the two doctors. The two doctors. He looks brilliant when he's got his coat off. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, that was just... Yeah. Just hurts my retinas. I'm sure it seemed like a good idea at the time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Not convinced. Mm. Do the sale of black and white televisions uh, increase during the mid eighties by any chance? <laughs> Possibly. You think with all the uh, the tech they've got these days, somebody could recolorize his costume so that it looks. Uh, a different I've actually color. seen. Uh, there's some people have done photos, and some people have actually done like short YouTube clips where they've done that, where they've oh, made okay. his costume look like it's uh, it's it's black and grey. Mm-hmm. Or they've done the where they've made it look all blue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks so good. Ah, uh, yeah, it would have made a world of difference. Mm-hmm. He got saddled with a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, I am a fan of the blue, but I, I kind of, I wouldn't go and replace it all blue. Oh. <laughs> I think I would recolorize it. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you seen the blue, the blue jacket, Matt? No, no. I think which stories I've seen: the twin dilemma. And Mark of the Rani. Yes. Yeah. And he's pretty vibrant in both of those. So, Matt, can I just ask, did you have to have the subtitles on when you were uh, watching Mark of the Rani? <laughs> uh, Cheeky no. sod. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not a million miles I'm away. I'm not going to get ours back on again. From the Northeast. <laughs> so, yeah. I could understand it. I'm not sure the actors playing the roles understand <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. You know. There's only where? one bit in that story where I think it sounds remotely like someone's from the northeast. It's the bit when I think the character's called Josh when he goes, I, I will. And that's it. I think that's the yeah, only yeah. bit that sounds any like from the northeast. Mm-hmm. It's the weird infatuation in that story they have with Toby jokes. <laughs> like no <laughs> nobody speaks like that. Everyone would just go, Yeah, I'm just gonna go grab a beer, have a glass of beer. Yeah. You know. But everyone's just like, oh, I've got to go fill me Toby. (laughs) (laughs) Not familiar with that phrase. (laughs) No, it took me ages to go, what on earth are they talking about? Yeah. (laughs) And the thing is, at no point do they go to the bar. They're forever in the bathhouse. Yeah. (laughs) But 10 out of 10 would recommend. That's my Mark of the Rani review. (laughs) We do seem to be talking about anything other than the TV movie, don't we? Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's our review. Yeah, that's my yeah. fault. I do tend to go off on tangents, I'm afraid. It's all right. We're nearly at the interval where Harry and Luke will be coming on. Ooh. So we you, you two can have a bit of a break for 20 oh, minutes nice. and then um, then come back on. Okay. We still need to talk about the Eighth Doctor in general. We're finished talking mm. about the Seventh. Yeah, I think that's enough. He's okay. <laughs> He's only He's in, in it for, for 20 about minutes. three or four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so eighth Doctor, um, discuss. What What do you think about his outfit? It's very trad, isn't it? Yeah, it's very you know it's very much in keeping with what's gone before. Yeah. Sort of going back more towards like a Pertwee or a an early sort of Tom Baker outfit. You could imagine them wearing that. It's funny how it, it's a, uh, it's just fancy dress. Mm-hmm. This Wild Bill Hickok yeah, outfit. Yeah. Yet, you know, considering the Doctor never really gets changed, mm. he must wear it for like he must hundreds of st- hundreds stink. of stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's grim, isn't it? Do you think it came in like a fl- one of those thought. flat PVC <laughs> packs? I've never once thought. Does he do his washing? I tell you what. <laughs> You know, in the console room, there's that hum. Mm. It's, it's not the console, it's his clothes. They must be absolutely <laughs> that, stinking. That's why McCoy didn't have the jumper on. It was, you know, hanging to dry. <laughs> <laughs> he just got his scruffs on. Oh, dear, yeah. That's why like, every single time it. that the Doctor regenerates, the first thing he thinks about, you clothes. Yeah, i got to yeah. change my clothes, yeah. Absolutely I mean, you never minion. know the mate it did on set as well. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's a look. I think it's all right. I mean, it's a shame about the wig, but, you know, you can't have everything. Is that why most actors, uh, you know, decide to leave the show after three years? I can't Could wear be. this. Could be, <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely yeah. stinking. Three years is the maximum out of here. Not to focus on Mark and the Rani, but I bet when Colin Baker saw that bathhouse, he was rubbing his hands. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Or maybe they wrote it in just to give him one. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, do you know the story? What happened when uh, that bit when he he rubs dirt on his face? Where, no. uh, oh you... yeah, no, I've heard that. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Do so tell. what happened was uh, it was basically full as earth, mixed in with a few bits and pieces, but it was clean BBC dirt. Uh, and then just before they uh, recorded it, a, a dog came along and went, "Oh, that's a nice <laughs> bit of uh, clean BBC dirt. I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I'll use that." Leave a message. <laughs> yeah. yeah, took a dump on it. Came to record that <laughs> take, and uh, Colin Baker unfortunately ended up rubbing shit all over his face, <laughs> and says that no one would speak to him for the rest uh, of the day. <laughs> if there's a shorthand for his era of the show, it really is. <laughs> Oh dear, poor Colin. <laughs> he deserved better. Bless him. <laughs> he did. He deserved I've so much. So that <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's brilliant. No, I like McGann's look. I think it's good. I think it's it suits his personality. Do you think audiences would have warmed to him over time if he stayed? I think. Anymore? Well, I think he. I think he pulls it off in that one episode. I think he's got a real charisma. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really vital and whoever they cast as the Doctor I think they've got to have a certain charisma about them and I think he's got it in spades I think he's really good mm. He was a very like human like kind of guy, there was no like weirdness to him or quirky, mm. bizarre yeah, stuff no playfulness that you get mm. with other I think that comes about a bit later when they once he signed up for Big Finish, I think they expanded on his character a lot more and you see a lot more of that come out mm. and he's quite sarcastic in some of his big finish yeah stories some of the later doctors like david tennant and matt smith mm-hmm. he finds it hard to relate to kind of his companions sometimes mm. like he, he, sometimes he, he misses things and doesn't understand things with emotions relationships yeah. and i feel like I think McGann is much more of a sort of uh, sort of classic American produced romantic leading man, yeah. which I'm sure we'll come to at some point with the uh, the kiss. Yeah. Do we go on to the kiss now? Oh, if you insist, Rob. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've told you before I like you a lot, but I just you know I'm not quite ready for that yet. But... You know, it's funny I'm mentioning the kiss. I've just remembered a dream I had before. Um, oh God, where's this going? Oh, before, I, I'm, I'm afraid I fell asleep before um, we started to record. Oh no! Uh, you know what? And Liam, you were there. Oh, and Matt, you oh, were my... there. It's weird we're that the, the kiss is what's jumping oh, in. Yeah, we're yeah. in the we're in the cloister room, and um, do you want yeah. me to just like shut off the speakers for a while? I'll just leave you guys to right, it. I'll not go into it. <laughs> More of a nightmare. <laughs> oh. oh, thanks. Oh, it's getting hot in here. Jeez. <laughs> can, can I indulge you when we come to this case? Is it that? It, it that's was? what you said in the dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, poor choice of words. But for, from what I gather, people have a big issue with the romantic doctor, the sexy doctor. Um, but again. If I just read this extract from the novel, I think this overcomes it somewhat. So, make sure you sat comfortably. What is it? Grace asked him. Something's happening. He grasped through clenched teeth. In my, my TARDIS. He's in my TARDIS. In your what? He then sat bolt upright, a huge smile across his face. Yes, he cried. Yes, I remember everything. Now here he was, running about the park, euphoric and full of energy. He ran towards her and suddenly stopped, smiling infectiously. Grace smiled back. I know who I am, he said simply. He hugged Grace tightly, kissing her full on the lips, passionately. Then he pulled back, embarrassment on his face. Sorry I got carried away. Grace shrugged. Well, fine, whatever. Then looked at him encouragingly. Well, who are you then? I'm the Doctor, he grinned. I am the Doctor, he shouted suddenly at the night sky. I am the Doctor. Great, said Grace, pulling him closer. Now kiss me again. He struggled free. 
no, 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 I'm sorry, no time. So he's like <laughs> Mills and Boone, flirting. the Doctor Who range. Yeah, oh, but wow. Yeah. It, it openly says there he kissed her because he was feeling euphoric, and then when he got a second mm-hmm. chance, he yeah. passed. Yeah. Can I just say, um, Matt, without m- wanting to make you too big-headed, um, I think Harry and Luke could learn a lot from your uh, your yeah. reading style there. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're getting there, though. Yeah. They're doing Biff, Chip and Kipper. They're learning. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I disagree with the idea that he's, you know, hmm. a womanizer. You know, it, it, he's euphoric, he's celebrating. Yeah. And then when it comes to his senses... Yeah. Am I right in thinking that the people that don't like it is just people that are kind of set in the old ways of the show, like that's that's not my doctor, he wouldn't do that. Well, I suppose when you think about it, if you were this old codger who's, you know, knocking on a bit like myself, and then you suddenly realise that you were this fit young bloke, you would be really happy. You would probably snog the first woman you saw. Yeah. Don't tell them you're an old man. <laughs> <laughs> So, because at the time when it was broadcast, I just, you know, accepted it. It wasn't until years later I discovered that this was apparently this big issue amongst yeah, Doctor Who fans. I never really just, had an really? issue. Really? I but... don't understand why. Mm. I mean, what, Mark, when you first watched it, I mean, was it, did, did you watch it and go, what the hell? This is disgusting. No, I mean, she's a very attractive woman, so you can mm-hmm. kind of understand. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but like Matt said, he's euphoric. He's realised mm-hmm. who he is. He's Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I never had an issue with it. I was fine with it. Sensible. Yeah, I don't know. No, I never understood why it was <laughs> why it was why it was apparently a, a problem for a lot of people. But I think there are a lot of people who aren't so fond of relationships um, forming between the Doctor and companions, romantic yeah. relationships, which I think is something else. Mm-hmm. You know, something that's still going thing, on now. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, don't and that's fine, you know, everyone's got their, their preferences, yeah. haven't they? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we'll give you guys a little break now. We're going to go over and speak to Harry and Luke for 20-odd minutes. Okay. A very specific time. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like you've recorded this before. Yeah. But yeah, we'll, uh, we'll give them a time limit. We'll okay. Get them off and we can come back on. <laughs> Thanks. See you in 20 minutes. And maybe get an extra brew on. Yeah, if that's all right, I might yeah, I might good. not get might not open the Red Bull because it's getting a bit late. Ah, uh, yeah, can I do God, shots of Pims? Night. What's that like, Mark? Or what can, what it... <laughs> You're asking the wrong bloke here. I got absolutely trousered on it. It's not um, can I do shots of Pims? It's should I do shots? Yeah. Of pims? <laughs> Have you got a mixer? Dust. Are you just drinking it neat? Mixer. <laughs> no. Do no, they have that in Newcastle? I'm sure they must have. What's Did that? Mixed with Bailey's <laughs> <A> mixer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, oh, with Bailey's, so yeah, okay. Uh, Rob, have you have an have you had an orgasm? What? <laughs> no. It it's a uh, it's a cocktail. It's uh, Bailey's yeah, and Cointreau. It's revolting. Yeah. So Just you put the Bailey's in and it curdles and it's audio. really lumpy. And that's your, that's your <laughs> right there. there you go. There's your trailer. That will be on the preview. <laughs> You're welcome. In fact, edit it in at the beginning when it goes, and Matt's here, hello, and Mark. Rob, have you had a knock? That's usually my opening gambit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so using a bit. Okay. Thank you for having us. Congratulations, 100 episodes. Thanks, guys. So now we welcome Harry and Luke from the Who Can Convince You podcast. Greetings. Hello. How are you doing? All right. You okay? Not bad. Uh, so you basically, okay, we're just. Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> are you okay, Rob? I'm okay. <laughs> Liam, how are you doing? Oh, we're okay, yeah. Are you Hi, okay, Liam? Liam? What's that? Are you okay? I did, yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. So, Liam, do you want to explain why they're on the show today? Uh, Yes. So, um, this is the, I was going to say the 100th anniversary. We haven't gone that long. It's the 100th podcast. Um, Well, we're getting the 100th anniversary. We can't can't (laughs) physically, can we? (laughs) Well, we don't know. Scientific advancements and all that. But, um, 
So this is the hundredth podcast, and we're celebrating by looking at the uh, the television movie with Paul McGann. So we're getting um, special guests on just to talk us about their earliest memories of watching it and their favourite moments of it. When are they coming on? No idea. But as you're here, <laughs> <laughs> we're around. We'll fill in. Yeah, at least till they get here. So who was around in '96 to see it? I was around, but I didn't see it as it. I was one. I was <laughs> one. I was none. I was a uh, yeah, twinkle in my dad's eye. So, what's your um, first memory of it? My first memory of the film, I think, I was aware of it probably around uh, uh, maybe like two thousand and one. I think. I'm trying to think when it, when did it come out on DVD? Do we know? I think I think it was 2001. Do you reckon? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it. I think I had I bought. Well, I say I bought. My parents bought Earthshock, the Lost in Time box set, and the movie, all in one. Because I think it was like three for two in HMV. And. I just remember thinking that there's there's a film of this. Like I I I didn't know that it was just sort of a, a TV thing. I thought it was sort of literally everybody in the world went to the pictures to go and see Doctor Who. <laughs> but no, yeah, that was my first. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, it would have just been the DVD. So do you think it didn't meet expectations? No, I I quite like it actually. I I know it gets a lot of flack. I think I think it gets a lot of flack because of the sort of Americanized. It's sort of like you know when they they tried to remake Red Dwarf in America, and it's sort of not that it doesn't work, but it's just Did got they? a different feel to it. Yeah. Oh Christ! And I think the humor didn't work. No, that. yeah, it's it doesn't land that sort of things. But I think you. It feels a bit safer with Doctor Who, but in the same way, it's just got a different look to it. That it's it feels it just looks American, but I think I think it does work, and I think it is enjoyable. But at the same time, it is a little bit sort of it feels like it could have just done something a bit more. It feels a bit safe. They might have been holding back because it. Obviously, it would have went to series. Yeah, well, yeah, that the yeah that was the the plan. That wasn't that the the plan was that the film would come out as the sort of look what's come in. Yeah, and thank- thankfully, it works really great as a standalone. As well. Yeah, because you'd assume that it would just sort of end with a bit of a mystery, but it does tie up, doesn't it? It just sort of yeah. Like imagine if we just had episode one of series one from the Russell yeah, era, like Rose, and that was it. Oh, wouldn't that have been a great <laughs> Doctor Who the movie too? Yeah, the other movie. <laughs> but yeah, no, I do, I do like it. I do, I, I've got a soft spot for it, and I think mainly because of Paul McGann, and I think Sylvester McCoy's great in it as well. For the you know the fifteen minutes that he gets <laughs> in it, he, he, is he in it? Yeah. Oh, he's he. I think he. He acts really well. The TARDIS set is gorgeous. It's probably one of my favourites, and it's the first sort of big mm, I remember that. TARDIS interior set, and it's all gothic and sort of Victoriana and, you know. Bit... It's a very moody film as well. I remember that. Mm, yeah, yeah, towards the end, I suppose. Not like the themes and stuff, but just like the the look of it, especially the TARDIS. Yeah, the, yeah. Especially comparison to like New Who now. I just I the the thing that's always been the bit of a sting for me is that I remember it must have been about two thousand one, two thousand two that I saw it. And then seeing that Doctor Who was coming back I just assumed Paul McGann would be doing it. Because oh. he was sort of the closest one I'd you know the eight-year-old or nine-year-old me when it was sort of announced that it's back and it's about time. It, I just assumed Paul McGann was just going to carry on just doing it. Well, even on the night, I thought 
well, we're just. I was. I thought we're just going to sit down, watch Paul McGann die, and then just get on with it all. Oh yeah, yeah even that yeah. didn't happen. No, it's yeah, and I think it's a shame, really, because I I think Paul McGann is great. The wig is terrible, but he really suits it. Like he looks great as the Doctor. He's probably the most Doctory Doctor in look. Like he just, mm. he's just great. It's and he's Paul McGann. It's Paul McGann. He's great. And he's so nice. And he's just... he Yeah, he's great. If he'd have had a series... I, uh, I do hope that if Russell does the whole multiverse thing, that he does give Paul McGann a sort of... the the, the lost years sort of, you know, pre-Time War thing or something. I don't know. I think it would work really well. And I think he's probably one of the only doctors that you could do it with now because mm-hmm. he's at a sort of age where he's he's aged well. So even though I think he's about 60 now, isn't he? He must be. Mm-hmm. He's still, you know, he looks exactly the same, really. He just looks like Paul McGann. And he's mm-hmm. sort of proven that he can do it with the Stephen Moffat thing where he was just great. You know, he's, you know, he's still got yeah. all the chops, so... I think it's one thing that fans have like consistently asked for as well. Yeah, the, yeah, it's it's so always been. There, why isn't not? It? Yeah. Ever since the film, everybody has just said, "Why don't you just get Paul McGann to?" Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like no, you, you, they give us plenty. Of Matt Smith, they give us Capaldi, but yeah, Paul McGann, I, nah, it, can't happen. <laughs> I'm I'm, sur- I'm really surprised that they haven't used him as a sort of a cameo doctor that appears every now and again. Mm -hmm. I find that really strange that they haven't gone down that route. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously they've had that one little 50th thing, wasn't it? That sort of came out. And to be honest, I probably prefer that to the 50th, but just because it's Paul McGann. Uh, I just think it's a perfect opportunity to have a sort of a midway point into classic doctor who that people can sort of, it's a film you know, so it's something that's recognisable and a bit easier to get into than sort of, obviously they can't bring Hartnell back from the dead. But, you know, it it just seems like such a good idea and nobody else seems to think that. And I remember, I think I was introduced to the film before I was introduced to, like, Dog Two, this series. And I remember I was at my nan's and it was on TV and it was a rerun. And I remember Paul McGann's wig and the TARDIS. That's about my earliest memory. Would this have been um, the year 2000 repeat? I think that's the only other time it was on, possibly. Yeah, I don't think it's ever been shown other than that, has it? Mm. Uh, well, obviously, when it came out. I definitely watched it on TV. I don't, yeah, know. I don't think it's ever been it shown. It must have been then. Yeah, it was. It was. I'm sure it was shown New Year's, New Year's Eve, and New Year's Day 2000 because Tom Baker did the whole um, oh, yeah, scenes I've around seen... that. He says, "Oh, I'm Paul McGann in this one." Yes. Yeah. It must have been, but unless I'm making it up, but I really do remember it. I would have been two, <laughs> but I really remember it. Like that's how I knew about Dog Two before the series because of the film. I remember the the blonde woman. I don't remember the master at all. Um, I remember, I remember being really bored. It's it's interesting with distant memories in Doctor Who because people like a lot of people seem to remember the Hartnell era wrong. Like there's some kind of Mandela effect and the yeah, there's some weird stories like that things that didn't yeah, even yeah. happen. It's like we knew who. I always seem to remember it was good, and then I won't go there. I'm glad we. Uh, it doesn't matter. This is about the film. Um, but I haven't seen it in years. But I do remember the TARDIS. I do remember Paul McGann's wig, and I disagree, Harold. I think it looks terrible. I love Paul McGann. I love him. What looks terrible? The wig. Yeah, I said the wig looks terrible. But Paul McGann, donning the wig. Oh right, doesn't okay. Even work for me either. I think he just looks great. It's the luscious locks, but they just don't work. They just don't work for me. I think. I don't think Daphne Ashbrook is 
I remember her being shite. No, I, I, <laughs> I think she's, I think she's great. But if it, again, it just feels a little bit safe, and the whole falling in love thing and the half human yeah. thing and Russell's uh, not here yet. No, because uh, I the kiss. I remember seeing the kiss, thinking, "What? <laughs> Why is this happening?" <laughs> but it's sort of you can you can almost forgive it because it's sort of it was barely a kiss. Yeah, so. you know, it was just and it and it feels a bit of a sort of you know just a bit of a not mistake, but a, yeah, midway through a regeneration, sort of oh, I don't know what I'm doing. So you can sort of forgive him for that. Um, and he he sort of he recovers it, doesn't he, with the shoes line? Is it, that's that's with the kiss, I think, isn't it? Where he says, "I've I've I've what does he say? I've worked it out or something." He said, "Finally, yes, I I understand it now. These shoes they fit perfectly." But he doesn't play it for like a joke. He plays it serious as sort of weirdness, and I think he's he's great at that. Where he he finds that fine line that's between it being funny and cringy where it just sits in the middle where you can sort of take it nearly either each way but it just works because it's alien i think he just feels very alien mm. and i like that i think it's good and what's the is it lee chang the, lee chang lee yeah he's okay is the master in the film yeah yeah i thought so yeah it's Kang Lee. the other companion, isn't it? The Asian child. Yeah. Not from my mind. The, the best. Asian child. Is that you peeling your fingernail off there, Liam? Yeah, yeah it is. Flicking it, it now. <laughs> Flicking it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think... The... Yeah, just the way that that nurse delivers the line, Bruce, you're sick. Thank you. Yeah. And then just walks off. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, I think... What's his name that plays the master? Can never think of his name. Eric, Eric Roberts. Eric Roberts. Julia Roberts' brother. Yeah. Mm. What What do you guys think? Obviously, we've just heard what you guys think in the episode. That was it. Was great, by the way. Um, <laughs> Thanks. What What do you? Th- but just to remind me, because what do you think of him? Of him or the story? Of him first, and then the story. Um. Of the Doctor, or we're not still on about the Master or Chang Lee. The Master. The Master. Oh, okay. Um, it's it's a bit pantomime, but that's the way it was meant to be played. And it's not that consistent with what came before, but it is what it is. It's it's Eric's Master. <laughs> Even the snake? Yeah, the snake. It's yeah. <laughs> I know. Liam... It's very theatrical. It's marvelously camp. Um, it was meant to be, though. It was no, I meant to be. I'm not, but the thing is, I'm not saying that as a criticism. It, I really like it. I think it's delightful, and it sort of works within the tone of the TV movie. I think it works well. Where the problem is, because um, I remember, I haven't listened to it recently, but um, when once I was watching it with the DVD commentary. And what they were saying is the idea was that during the course of the film, Eric Roberts would be made to look look like his body was dying and decaying. And the, the bit when he peels off his fingernail is pretty much the only thing that remains of that because Eric uh, Roberts right, okay. was actually quite a bit vain and didn't want to make... Didn't no. Want to, yeah, I yeah, know. <laughs> uh, and didn't want to be made up look like his body was falling apart, which narratively is actually very important. And apparently he w- he would only let himself be seen in certain angles as well. Yes, that was it as well. So I think that's a shame uh, because I think narratively that whole thing would have worked. Well, it's important. It's the whole thing of why the Masters needs to get all the Doctor's lives. So th- yeah. that's a shame. But everything else, it's sort of, I don't mind it. I just think it's entertaining. Yeah, yeah. it's it's just fun. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's just fun. And I yeah. think you... It's. I think you have to sort of look at it in two ways as well. Like half of your brain says it's canon and half of your brain just treats it like a Cushing film mm-hmm. where it's sort of, it's not real, but <laughs> it is, but it isn't. Mm-hmm. And I really like the theme tune as well. I yes. know people hate it, 
People really hate oh, that like, one as I well. I like the theme tune. I think it's great. Feels big. Yeah, mm. I'm in. And I'm not sure. The only bit that I'm not sure about the theme is that they sort of they start with the hero bit, don't they? The middle mm. eight is like the opening bit rather than. But then again, it does make it more filmy straight mm. away to come in with that sort of, you know, with the middle eight bit. Yeah, they do a fantastic job with that because if you're going to uh, do a th- um, orchestral version of the theme tune, that's the way to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's just big. There's, yeah. They just went down the big route. Well, uh, let's all just play the theme. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure about the terrible Dalek voices in that sort of prologue bit, but that's unfortunate. <laughs> but isn't that isn't that the uh, director doing the voice for that? I forgot. Yeah, that. I think yeah. so. Jeffrey yeah. Sachs. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. 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 But it all I love that intro. That just it's just great. Those timpani hits and it says Scaro and mm-hmm. you nearly wet yourself. <laughs> it's just great. It just makes me want to watch the film though. I mean I've watched the film for this, obviously, but I I, I want to watch it again. Mm-hmm. It's just it's great. Should do a watch along. Yeah. Yeah. Com- Tweet- comment- commentary. Tweet alongs are they the are they still uh, a thing? I've never followed those. No, it's a, it's an area of Twitter I don't really want to. I don't want to go in. Nah. It's, it's like yeah, no, no thanks. Um, so do you each have a favorite moment from the movie? It's not give him the gun or the motorbike scene. Give give him the keys. That's give him the way. keys. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not give him the gun. <laughs> Bloody that's, hell. <laughs> that's a different movie give him the gun um uh oh that's tricky i think it's probably the either the intro i know it sounds stupid but like the prologue of scarrow into the theme i think is really strong and seeing the tardis like nearly hit the camera and it sort of goes back i think that's great and then those initial scenes of Sylvester McCoy, who's sort of f- visibly older, just wandering around this huge TARDIS set with the old sonic screwdriver. It's so Doctor Who, that. And it's just it's just gorgeous. It just looks great, all of that stuff. Have they done a four have they done a Blu-ray release of it? Yes, but unfortunately, it's the DVD version. It says on the back of the box, standard definition, upscale. And right. which it's a disappointment because they could have physically went back to the film and done a proper um, yeah. version of it. I hope they do. Is it like the first um, four seasons of New Who? Are they? Oh yes, upscaled. they're they yeah they're upscaled yeah. yeah. But they, they yeah, but they were they they existed in digital with yeah, with with, with the movie they could actually go to the film. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. It looked great as well. Like, if they upscale that. But yeah, I'd say my favourite bits are probably those initial um, McCoy scenes and the regeneration scene. I think that's done really well. The whole mirroring of the Frankenstein thing and then the punching of the door. I remember that scared the shit out of me as a kid. I just thought it was terrifying. Like, oh my God. And the maybe the who am I is a little bit over the top, but it... It just works so well. There's so many good bits in it, really. I can't believe it gets so much flack. It's crazy. Yeah. People love to hear it. Yeah. Uh, I, just Lu- love to, I just love to love it. Yeah. Luke, yeah, you haven't got many memories of it, but you've got to pick a favourite moment, I'm afraid. Um, I remember two scenes in particular, so they have to be my favourites because I remembered them. One where the doctor's outside his TARDIS and he's on the floor screaming at something. <laughs> Another one, he... I think... Oh, he's running down an alleyway very quickly and it's very misty and dark. I I can't remember any f- scenes in this film that were in the day. All in my mind is it's just dark. It's almost like a noir film. I remember being scared as well. I'm bored. Weird. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember I never finished it. I yeah. can't think what the bit of right running down a corridor is. It was yeah. just down the alleyway with a load of mist and stuff. I, again, it might be uh, uh, what you were talking about before, Rob, with uh, Hartnell Zero. Like, it's yeah. just made it up. I, I think you do. should never watch it. Just keep it as a memory, because that sounds pretty good. 
I remember so little. It's not like, you know, it's not like Babe 2. I remember a lot of Baby 2, but not all of Baby 2. But I rewatched Baby 2, and it is it's a classic. But I feel like I, I I remember so little. It's almost like a, a a fever dream I had when I was little. And it's haunted me ever since. But I can't wait to watch it again. But I do remember the titles, and I have seen the titles since. Uh, so I think that has to be my favorite. Because it's so good and bad at the same time. It makes me want to cry. I don't know what emotion I should be feeling. So just go straight for the cry. So I'm going to go for the open titles. And the music's great. I do like the music. Oh, well, uh, thanks for joining us today. You're very welcome. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, of course, check out Luke and Harry's podcast, Who Can Convince You? It's wccy.com. Is it? Oh, that UK. Look, no. UK. I will Look, never make that UK. mistake again. Um, <laughs> Yeah, wccy.co.uk. Uh, oh, well, cheers. Um, we'll speak to you again soon, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Uh, see you around. Cheers. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 That was Harry and Luke there. Now we're back with Mark and Matt. That was fascinating. Yeah. Really enjoyed that. It was good, wasn't it? Yeah, they're really good. Did you say that, Liam? I zoned out. I fell asleep. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Wow, everyone's a critic. Jeez. <laughs> Mark, have you ever had a blowjob shot? <laughs> um, not that I can recall. I think I would probably remember that. <laughs> so, so what is that? Is that a Newcastle thing? Yes, it's like, I, was one, I don't know, it's got like Bailey's in and it's got like cream on top, but then you, you've got to like right. pick it up with your lips and then just oh. tip your head back. And swallow oh. it. No, we're far more civilized down here. We have things like Baby Guinness, which is uh, Bailey's and Kahlua. And it's like mm. a little tiny mini shot of Guinness. It's really nice. Have we got any re- Taste regional of coffee. drinks apart from brown ale? Not aware of. I mean, you're really selling <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the classic image of the Northeast. Of, yeah. What was it called? A blowjob shot. Freaking hell. <laughs> oh, and I wonder why we have the reputation that we mm. have. Sounds like a good night out in uh, Newcastle. Yeah, I, I used to come to the big market sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I was out in Newcastle, I wound up in Sergeant Pepper's. Oh, my. Um, right. Nice. Yeah. Um, Sounds like a slightly iffy establishment. I've never been back since. Uh, yeah. Uh, usually I just end up in Powerhouse or Pop World. Is Powerhouse still open? I don't know. I haven't been out. I mean, I'm sorry. I know this is really crude, but the fact that they have actually advertised that the entrance is now round the back. All right. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, so, but, I mean, but the thing is, it's a gay. It is a gay bar. And it's just, <laughs> is that deliberate or accident? I don't know. But uh, there used to be a pub in yeah. Exmouth called the Ferret and Radiator. Oh. Don't know. All right. Okay. Mm. I want. I want to strange. Close to where I live, there's a pub called The White Bear, and it had one of only three taxidermied polar bears in Britain. That, wow. That was wow. That... Taxidermy is a big thing around your way, isn't it, Matt? It's not much else to do in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> you see a rat, you stuff a rat. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that a hit for Chumbawamba back in the day? <laughs> Mark, what are the pubs like where you are? Are the, are the carpets sticky? Uh, if you're going to Weatherspoon, yeah. Is this part of the pod? Yeah. Or is this still yeah. the mid-break? Like... No, no, we're back. <laughs> right. I mean, this is the main event. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Sorry, Lee. Yeah, we have like time. traditional uh, ye olde country pubs. Hmm. And we also have the, the god-awful Weatherspoons as well, so... Hmm. You pays your money, you takes your choice. So back to the TV movie. We've got a few. Uh, oh yes, we've got a yeah, few segments to yeah, get through yet. Happened. Oh, good. Next up, the TARDIS. So it's had a radical redesign. Just a little bit. Any first impressions when it happened? I think it's glorious, isn't it? How could you not love that TARDIS interior? The console is just 
it's very Jules Verne, isn't it? Has it got a bit a bit of stigma amongst fans? Like, oh, that was a know. bit gothic. Maybe, maybe I'm not down with the the cool kids, but um, the, no, I love it. I think it's really cool. It's got that kind of steampunk vibe to it. it looks really nice. Not entirely sure about the the gothic interior. Would you choose that as a living space? Looks a bit cold, but maybe that's just me. So I think it looks quite warm, but then oh. maybe if you're comparing it to, you know, other periods of um, Doctor Who, including the, mm-hmm. the modern era. I mean, of of all the TARDIS interiors that you know we have, you would go right. You've got to choose one, and you're going to live in it. Mm. I think I would pick the TV movie. Yeah, if my uh-huh. wife would let me and we lived in a warehouse, totally go for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, in the novelization. It's it, this doctor's been traveling alone for a while, so it makes sense that it's more homely rather than just a spaceship, if that makes sense. Mm, you know, you yeah. can imagine it's almost like his retirement home, <laughs> you know, he's <laughs> yeah. settled and this is how <laughs> he would want it to be. You get the impression. That's where he wants to be rather than out and about mm-hmm. adventuring. Mm. Yeah. I like the addition of the uh, the sound system. That's always good. Nice choice of music as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and it's it's really subtly woven in, isn't it? The the theme mm. of time. Isn't yeah. It? It's, uh, oh, yeah, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, yeah but blink mm-hmm. and you miss it. I mean, you know, you've got the full array of clocks. Mm-hmm. You know, time being stuck on the phone. You know, oh, oh well, it's missing. It's playing. Let's take. Let's play time by Pink Floyd. That's the only thing that's missing. <laughs> yeah. Ah, they missed a trick there. Yeah, and we saw some uh, brief glimpses of a corridor outside the cloister room, and mm. the cloister room itself, which was massive. Yeah, and then you got this sodding great eye of harmony in the middle of the tower. What's that What's doing that there? About? Yeah, not meant to be there. What happened to this continuity heavy? show we've started watching suddenly it's all bets are off you just lob stuff around wherever you like it's a bit of a design flaw as well isn't it that it's got to be am i right remembering right you've got to have a human eye to make it open that's hmm. the one thing of the, the the story to me doesn't make any sense where's the explanation for that why hmm. is it a human eye and if the doctor's half human is he able to open half of it I don't... <laughs> Just his left eye opens. Yeah, he's got a <laughs> <laughs> he's got a wink. <laughs> and it had like Rassilon on the rods. <laughs> Rassilon's head? Or was it just some bearded dude? <laughs> um, again in the book it specifies it's Rassilon. Oh. Ah. Oh. Interesting. Mm. I wonder who the model was for, for Rassilon. Where did they get that image from? Philip Siegel's dad. Probably Roger Moore. Oh, right. And they went to the set, they got the beard from the wig shop. <laughs> can you get fake beards? Yeah, yeah. I know you can get like costume beards. There's a John Sim master joke coming up there, isn't there? Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Do we want to talk about the characters themselves? We've talked about the Doctor, uh, the Master. Mm-hmm. He plays the Master quite differently to how others have in the past. It's a game of two halves, really, isn't it? He plays this psychotic nut job who's kind of a bit of a Terminator-style character who's hunting the Doctor to get his remaining lives. And then as soon as he throws on his big swishy gown, he turns into super camp <laughs> master mode, doesn't he? Not that there's anything wrong in that. I think he's great. I think he steps up a gear when he... Uh, Announces that he always dresses for the occasion. Yeah. Matt's completely nonplussed. Uh, I totally zoned out. My phone went. And he's it's, not... it's because he's only got eyes for Anthony Ainley. Yeah. yeah. No other master can compare. Mark, do you ever draw a connection with the master's eyes in the prologue to survival? Yes. Yeah, I think that's that did cross my mind at the time. Yeah, it, it must be very confusing for a, a new viewer because this guy's supposed to be the same species as the Doctor, but he starts off as this weird sort of globby 
snake thing. Um, and then he just turns into an ambulance driver. And then some sort of crazy dude in a big swooshy gown. I wonder if Eric Roberts would have returned if the master had returned. Because mm. I guess they kind of blew his body up. Doesn't Eric Roberts' master appear in one of the big films? Yeah. Yeah, he is yeah, back. He's now, back isn't he? big time. Yeah. Has any, anyone listened to that? I have. It's really good. Have you listened? Which ones have you listened to? Because he comes. I've listened. He comes in the main Doctor range yeah. in. Um, is it? Um, Ravenous. Ravenous yeah, I two heard, or three. Because I tend to dip in and out. There's one <laughs> with lots of the masters, and yeah. there's one where he's an absolute. Do you swear on your podcast? Um, if it's warranted. Is it? If it's justified, if you can, you justify it. If you can say it, he's an absolute bastard to another oh. one of the the masters. Oh, okay. I won't spoil it for anyone who's going to uh, what, listen to it. The but... explanation for him coming back as that iteration of the Doctor, because obviously at the end that body fails, and he's out. Only... He's only in that body because it just happened to be the ambulance driver that the snake mm-hmm. jumped into. Mm, is that explained? Because he does have his own sh- his own series called Master with an exclamation. Mm, yeah. Um, with Chase Masterton, who yeah is from she's a dabble girl from DS Nine, mm-hmm. and she's been. She's had her own series on Big Finish as well, hasn't she, I think? Yeah, Vienna, yeah. which started off uh, as one of the seventh Doctor monthly stories. Mm-hmm. And she's, I think she's had three or four series since. Yeah. And now she's a recurring character in the Master series. Yeah. But we don't know how he's back. <laughs> I think he's... I think in that Master series, I think there's... Uh, again, it's, uh, it's difficult because you don't want to spoil it for the potential listeners. Mm. But yeah, he starts off as this kind of nebulous ghostly voice haunting Chase Masterson's character oh, and then okay. uh, obviously things move on and he takes corporeal form again has he had a big face off with Paul McGann yet on audio I don't know uh, sure. or is that something that they just haven't done yet hmm. I feel like that would be a big deal because when he first made his debut on audio mm. on the ravenous box set. Yeah. He was kind of sidelined uh-huh. on the front cover. It would yeah. that, that kind of baffled mm. me. Why is he not sent a stage? Like, maybe they wanted it back. to be a surprise. Had it yeah, leaked maybe. before that came out that he was going to be in it? I think they just announced it. Right. Because mm. mm. I think, isn't there an issue with they can't use um, the companions from the TV movie on Big Finish because of a rights thing? That's right, yeah. And they've got the actors doing other roles. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't know, did we mention this in the rehearsal? Bitch, or was yeah. it on the... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the, they do play two unit operatives in Big Finish's Vault series, which okay. is a unit facility set under the Angel of the North, ah. which is a facility there to contain the Master. Nice. Yeah. Jeffrey Beaver's master's down there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought that's quite quite a random and cool connection for us. Mm. Well, it's Gateshead, not Newcastle, so we can't even have that connection. <laughs> yeah, it's close enough. There or thereabouts. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Any other characters you want to go through? We've got we've got Grace. Um, she makes her first scene um, in the opera. I don't know how how well you think that scene was uh, directed. You have to kind of suspend your disbelief and imagine she's actually there rather than among a small group of people. I think it works. It's you know, it's obviously it, it saves money. You they couldn't see, you know uh, shoot it in a big opera and have have a full you know <laughs> thing on you know. But you just you know you've got the sound of the opera going on and you got a small group within the audience. It works. I don't think I just go ha that looks cheap. Yeah, um, shedding a tear as well. Yeah, she's cultured and sensitive. What more mm. could you possibly want? You know, it's you know, really good setup for the character. You know, she's uh, she's cultured, mm-hmm. sensitive, mm-hmm. but she's a doctor because she's on call. It's all yes. established in there, you know, within mm. a few lines. And yeah, I suppose it, that do you think she'd well. really be able to run and then operate <laughs> in that dress? Well, she's had to take her shoes off, so at least that was realistic. Yeah. All right, yeah. yeah. 
makes all the difference. Yeah. Mm. But I, I know she's not exactly the same, but she fits into the strong female companion that and we, I know we've seen in classic, but they kind of build on that with Rose and there's definitely mm-hmm. a lot of similarities with Martha, although they're very, very different. So I, yeah. I think I think I, I don't think Grace is perfect as a character, but mm. she's almost a bedrock that those characters are built on. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's like it's like everything that she's got. It's like she's cultured, she's sensitive, she's principled. Mm. Uh, you know, she knows. You know, uh, she's you know she's a very good surgeon, but she mm. makes a mistake. But that's because she's dealing with the alien physiology yeah. of the doctor. Wants mm. to know, wants to learn from from those mistakes. Um, but the fact that there's going to be that this cover up um, with you know, with the hospital director, and she's like, I'm having no part of this. So you know, she's principled. Um, you know, she's witty, she's humorous, and then, you know, and then you got that scene at the end when she enters the TARDIS for the first time, and she's talking about, you know, temporal displacement. Mm-hmm. You know, so she's clued up on popular science yeah. and all the rest of it. So it's she ticks all those boxes. I was getting uh, Liz Shaw vibes. Yeah. Yes, I think yeah, I think it's a good compare. Yeah, accurate or not? Hmm. In fact, actually, because for the first time when I was watching uh, for the purpose of this podcast, I thought that there's the first it's sort of like um all the stuff that's in the the hospital is like a re it's like a modern retelling of spearhead from space mm-hmm. you know those first two episodes you know yeah. the, the doctor in a hospital the way that he finds his clothes yeah introduced to the new companion obviously it's it's mm-hmm. not like for like but no. uh, i was i was making those comparisons i thought yeah. this is sort of like a modern retelling of spearhead from space mhm and as i said even the way that the doctor finds his you know his clothes it's it's in a hospital changing room it doesn't yeah. quite make sense why someone would have a fourth Doctor scarf. <laughs> fourth Doctor scarf. It's a bit. It's a bit <laughs> meta, but you know, maybe it was the Doctor scarf. <gasps> oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't I read somewhere that if it had gone to a series, they were talking about bringing back old Doctors um, for episodes? <clears throat> yeah, apparently, according to Sylvester McCoy, he would have dropped in for a, for a few mm-hmm. episodes and give Paul a bit of a break for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Did I remember it right that they were going to sort of reshoot old stories, but with new effects and stuff? Or did I imagine that? I'm sure I heard that somewhere. Yeah, I think there's been some confusion with that because when they first came up with the idea that, um, I think this was back when it was with Amberlin, they had a, um, Mm -hmm. I think what they called it, sort of like the Doctor Who Bible. And and within that, they talked, they discussed stories like uh, Genesis of the Daleks and the Talents of Uh Wang Chiang and, you know, these classic well-regarded stories mm-hmm. and i think it's this there's still some confusion there's some people who say well the intention was yes to basically retell those stories yeah and then i think philip siegel has said well maybe but i don't think that was the full intention i think it was just to to say we've got these stories that we could be inspired by mm-hmm. more as a sort of idea for tone yeah terry nation redid stories a lot didn't he <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Kept redoing it. <laughs> what do we? What do we think of the plot? Such very, as it is, very, it's a very coherent story. Apart from mm. all the nonsense that new viewers might not understand, mm. it's a well-rounded story considering it's a pilot that could have went to series. Yeah, and it works well as a standalone. There's a few nice little set pieces. You've got the sort of the the chase on the highway and. You got the scenes in the the party mm-hmm. and the whole countdown as well, which I think works really well with the whole time metaphor and the countdown to uh, the start of the the millennium. Yeah, I think Matthew Jacobs did a really good job with the script. I mean, yes, the mm. the the basic plot is a very simple one, but I haven't got a problem with that. It's a yes, it's a simple story, but I think it's told well. I think yeah. it's structured well. Uh, yeah, you got the theme of time. Mm-hmm. Obviously, uh, you got a sense of rebirth, which is woven throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Um, it's got pretty much everything that you would want. You've got uh, you've got drama, intrigue, horror, romance. You know, it ticks all those boxes. But I think they're mm. they're woven and incorporated into it uh, reasonably well. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I, th- I think Matthew Jacobs does a does a good. Uh, I mean, does a does a really good job with the script, and Jeffrey Sachs, uh, the director, does a brilliant job directing it. It's. Uh, I know that we're focusing on the story, but uh, it looks gorgeous. Mm. Yeah, it's really beautifully shot. Yeah, and considering all the kind of creative arms that must have been pulling the story here and there, uh, all that, considering Matthew Matthew Jacobs did do a good job. The uh, one thing, because one thing he he it was definitely from what I can understand, it was definitely his idea. I just want to get what your um what you feel about the the thing about the Doctor being half human. Yeah, I think it's. You get bits of canon that tend to click and stay, and then there's other bits that just get glossed over and forgotten about. And I think this is very much in the the latter category. Yeah, I don't mind that it happened and we've kind of moved on. Hmm. I don't think it needs to be something that gets addressed or forgotten about. Would it be as big a deal if it wasn't in this one episode? Because, because this was like a reimagining, a new start, a new dawn. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be that they intentionally drop that in because that's going to be a new facet of this character. Mm-hmm. But if it uh-huh. had come mid season and a Doctor Who'd, you know, had been established on the show, just mentioned it offhandedly once, I, I don't yeah. think it would have that impact. I think it is because. The hopes, the expectation, the new start, the new dawn with this TV effective brand new pilot for the new show. I, I mm-hmm. think that is what snowballed that point. Mm. Yeah, I think I've seen a suggestion that um, the idea was to <clears throat> make him slightly more relatable to the audience. And I think they, again, this is just fan wisdom i think they kind of got the idea from spock from star trek because he's like half human half vulcan to try and make them a bit more relatable for for new audience and matthew jacobs has got a new documentary coming out i think he's been working on it for a very long time called doctor who am i Mm -hmm. Uh, i think that's coming out pretty Mm -hmm. soon so that's a lot of stuff focusing on the tv movie so it might be worth checking out and were you aware that his dad had been in Doctor Who. Was that the gunfighters? Yeah. It was, yeah. So yeah. just showing off. Was it the gunfighters? <laughs> I knew it was the gunfighters. Yeah, even I knew that. <laughs> no, and I know yeah. that. Ant- <laughs> Anthony Jacobs played Doc Holliday in the gunfighters. Mm-hmm. He was really good in it as well. And um, Matthew was also on set. Mm. Wow, you remember yes. that? Yes. He got invited down as a kid, yeah. That's cool, isn't it? Obviously left a lasting effect on him because he had wanted to write the TV movie. Gunfighters is a good story. I do think it's marred it. by that song, but uh, oh, I, can, I, don't I, can mind for, it. I can forgive it. It's uh, The rest of it's too good. I've got the book mm. of the Gunfighters. I, quite, I haven't read that yet. Ah. I is that peppered that. with the lyrics of the song? Oh, the end of the chapter? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Just a trick yeah. there. Oh, imagine if they do it on audiobook. Who are they going to get to uh, to narrate it? He's got the chops to be able to do the singing as well. Peter Purvis. Oh, he's still course. around. Yeah, yeah. Any links to the classic era that you want to talk about? They do like to shoehorn in a few bits of continuity, don't they? The Daleks but... were there, but in like a weird capacity. Yeah. Like Scarrow was there, even though it's been destroyed. The Daleks mm. were there, but they don't sound the same. No. Um, no. Maybe they'd uh, maybe they'd been listening to um, Day of the Daleks when they <laughs> got the idea of where to get their voices from. Um, the Doctor has thirteen lives. Is that straight out of um, the Ultimate Foe, or is it was it or was it already like established Doctor Who law at some point? Uh, I think, it was I think first it's a deadly assassin. Oh, deadly assassin. Yeah, yeah, of course. Assassin, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although I'm sure in um, Creature from the Pit, doesn't he mention how he has thousands of lives or something? Oh yeah, I mean it's um isn't the oh yeah, um Sarah Jane Adventures with yeah, it's, it's one with like Matt Smith. Or so. Death of the Doctor, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He did that on purpose, yeah. Yeah. It's good. 
yeah, it's um, canon yeah. is fluid. Mm-hmm. And we know the answers now, like unlimited anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, until they change it again. <laughs> until we find out that wasn't even true. Ah, uh, they woke up and it was all a dream. <laughs> um, the music was good, like the soundtrack. Oh, the music's mm. fantastic. I, I love the revamped theme tune. Coming in with the mid late first, that was uh, a bit controversial. I do think the. Because, um, where, you know, when people talk about the Doctor Who theme, it tends to mm-hmm. everyone focus usually on the original, but the idea, you know, that it's uh, electronic, it's ethereal, it's creepy. Yeah. Um, and you try and incorporate an electronic element, which was there throughout the, the whole of the original run, it, and it's came back to a greater or lesser extent in the new mm-hmm. series. Um, if you're going to do an orchestral arrangement of the theme tune, if this is definitely the way to do it. It's really, it's just really great. It's uh, it's upbeat. It's uplifting. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's done incredibly well. It gets you excited for the story you're going to watch, and then at the end of the credits, it, it and you know it takes you out on a high. I d- yeah. do think it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it plays um, really well. Because uh, Matt, yeah, I think you've said that it's your favorite version of the theme tune. Is that That's right? right? Yeah, yeah. I- just because it is so different, you know, like like you've mentioned, if you if you asked anybody in the street to sing the Doctor Who theme, they they're gonna you know, and just to <laughs> flip that, I, 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 yeah, I, I love it, and I I do think it, like, I like the 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 theme as we know it is it plays into almost the mystery of the character, whereas this is almost like the Christopher Reeve Superman thing. It's about the yeah. heroic nature of mm-hmm. the character. Mm-hmm. And I like that that one piece of music with just a subtle change shows both aspects of the character. Mm. I think they did really well with the whole time vortex tunnel effect. Which we've had yeah. in the show what, um, early on, what like Pertwee, um, Tom Baker, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, yeah, this kind of introduced it and inspired it in the new series, I guess. Mm. Well, having all like the names flying, flying at you down the screen, and yeah, the TARDIS flying around in the vortex as well. Mm. Um, I guess that ties into um, the legacy it's left behind for the new era, which will. We'll get to, um, oh, we'll get to that next. The next segment is the legacy. <laughs> <laughs> so, should we talk about the what effects it's had on the new era? I think it's like a bridge, isn't it, between the classic series and the revitalized series? I think uh, RTD when he brought back the series in two thousand and five, the first thing that strikes me that he's taken in a slightly reverse way from the uh, TV movie is to not have Paul McGann turn up for the first 10 minutes and then regenerate into Christopher Eccleston. Did you expect or hope that he might? Um, I kind of expected it just because that's what we'd always had, um, bar Colin Baker. Um, but, yeah, I think... Well, they could have it... put Eccleston in the wig. They could have. They could have. <laughs> but I think it works really well, the way they did it. And again, I think that's a learn from the TV movie. Mm-hmm. But I think, um, particularly with Tennant's Doctor, I, I see parallels between him and McGann's Doctor. They have that kind of a very mm-hmm. similar sort of uh, character to them. So I think, yeah, there are definitely similarities. The TARDIS is quite similar. It's uh, the console room's very large. Mm-hmm. the The centerpiece, like the time rotor, goes into the ceiling, like it yes. did in the TV movie. Mm. And also, the struts around the console match the kind of coral struts. Yeah, that we get. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can kind of imagine like the transition between one to the other. Yeah, very much so. Mm. I think the big thing was. Um, at the time, it gave extra life support for for the show, 
um, mm. because it you know originally cancelled in eighty nine, and although it was just only for for one night, I think one thing that it did do was it showed in if not in America, certainly in Britain, mm. that people were still interested in it. Yeah. Because uh, the viewing figure, you know, was I think it was nine million or something like that. Yeah. So it wasn't just Doctor Who fans tuning into it; it mm. was general viewers as well, and everyone seemed to have a really good time and enjoyed it. And it got, you know, um, it was well reviewed at the time, and mm. the BBC seemed to take it back on board. So at that yeah. point, uh, you know, Doctor Who was rebranded. Um, you know, Virgin Books, which had been publishing the New Adventures their license wasn't renewed it was now Mm -hmm. you know it was taken back on board with bbc books were doing the the novels um yeah things like that so the i think that was a good thing the bbc took it back on board and recognized that there was something of worth here and it was a beloved show and wasn't something Mm. that necessarily didn't have to be embarrassed by so i think that was important and i think it was on the cards to come back for quite a while before it eventually did i think rtd had been badgering the top brass at the BBC for <clears throat> quite some time mm-hmm. to re- to have a crack at it. Yeah, it felt like an eternity as well. It was only nine years. So yeah, weird. yeah, bizarre. I mean, it feels like we have a quite a long wait between series now, particularly because of COVID and everything that's happened recently. But yeah, when you when you go from the, the cancellation through to the TV movie. And then from the TV movie through to the start of series one, mm. it's uh, yeah, it goes very quickly in hindsight. Mm-hmm. But at the time, it did feel it did feel like a lifetime. I think especially yeah. because when you got the TV movie and it didn't, I mean, I think uh, it took me a long time to realize that it wasn't coming back. I think it probably took mm. a year, and I went, mm, "It's not coming back," because I wasn't mm. a massive. I, I sometimes bought Doctor Who magazine. Yeah. Now and again, but I think if I was a regular reader of it, I think it probably would have been reported in there that it wasn't mm-hmm. coming back. So it took me yeah. quite a while. So there was me, what you know, having watched the TV movie thoroughly enjoyed. It. it was like, right, when's the series yeah, starting? Looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Um, and I think because it didn't come into a series, I think certainly my expectation of it was, mm, I don't think it's going to come back on the TV. Mm. But obviously, behind the scenes, as you said, Mark, it was you had RTD who was trying to drum up interest. Yeah. And they called it the wilderness years, but yeah. in terms of creativity, I think it was one of the most interesting because you had all this stuff going on. You had the new adventures, you had the eight doctor adventures, so you had the whole book thing going on. Mm-hmm. And then you'd have uh, BBV starting off with their sort of audio uh, adventures, which then eventually culminated in Big Finish. A lot of the same people, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a time of immense creativity and. Um, they really helped to keep the, the flame alive as well in the meantime. Mm-hmm. Talking about the Eighth Doctor BBC books, mm. if there's a big legacy left behind by the TV movie, not taking into account the modern era, but mm. all the expanded media. So I'm sure there was like 80 odd books from BBC books. Right. A big bunch of novellas from Telos Publishing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A great deal of audios from Big Finish. Mm-hmm. A full range of comics from Doctor Who magazine, yeah, um, yeah, and I don't know what else I'm missing out, but that's a hell of a lot of stories. So mm. big legacy left behind by the movie. It's a crazy thing, isn't it? Now you think for anyone wanting to kind of dip their toe into it, if they've just seen their first episode and they fancy checking out old Doctor Who, there's just so much of it. Must be quite a scary proposition. I think it's nice that they did decide to bring Paul McGann back for The Night of the Doctor. I think he really deserved to have that end to his story. I think that's excellent. For a a four Mm. minute, you know, cut away, you know, I I had no idea that existed. But when Mm. David and I were doing Name of the Doctor, Day of the Doctor, we we Mm -hmm. just finished. And then out of nowhere, David went, oh, you need to watch this. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's the point? This is going to be some next time trailer or (laughs) something. And yeah, yeah, my jaw was on the floor. Because I hadn't Mm. even heard that that existed or that it was a thing. And, you know, that Mm -hmm. that super, super suave, super, super cool line 
of you know yeah yeah i am a doctor but maybe not the one you're expecting the reveal it's McGann. yeah just mm-hmm. you know a perfect way to bring him back and send him off i don't know what his secret is but he is still looking pretty good for his age isn't he yeah he doesn't need wigs yet no <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you were saying about the suave line. I just love the um, his lines when he gets his regeneration. The one that really stands out for me is "Bring me knitting." I love that. It's just so funny. Yeah, it that line because I think um, Stephen Moffat's always said is that you don't write the Doctor differently. You can write mm-hmm. the Doctor exactly the same. It's always yeah. the actor who brings it. Oh. Mm-hmm. That line always stood out to me because I went that Stephen Moffat kind of proving his point. Because mm. I could, you know, you could easily see that line being written for David Tennant's Doctor, Matt yeah. Smith's Doctor, you know, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, but Paul McGann makes it his own, you know, th- just h- through his interpretation as an actor. And because of Night of the Doctor being so popular, <clears throat> there has been quite a vocal uh, call for a Paul McGann series, which he... I would be well up for. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact... Mark and Matt, are you because so we're recording this on the fifteenth of May, mm-hmm. where uh, a new Doctor Who news has just landed a few hours before we recorded. Are you aware mm. of it? Yes. 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 Well, you'd you'd said there's some news out there. And I said, <laughs> well, I don't want to know. Tell me later. I'll avoid social media. <laughs> so I was, you know, like my hand was instinctively going to Twitter. I thought, no, can't do that. I'll check my emails and the official Doctor Who bloody newsletter. Uh-huh. Mm. Had it in the subject. Yeah. Yay. So the news is is that David Tennant and Catherine Tate will be coming back uh, mm-hmm. to Doctor Who under Ooh, the, the new regime. Goodness. Yeah, okay, well, that's Rob. We know wow. your reaction. I'm joking. <laughs> no, but it was just the thing is just sort of right. If, okay, so we're having those two back, but if the option was that mm. or Paul McGann coming back instead. How is that even a question? It might be for some people. Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, with David Tennant, I, I like David Tennant. He's not necessarily my favourite Doctor, but I like him. And I, he's super popular with the more sort of casual viewer. Uh, but he's he's had a decent run. He's had four series. He's had some uh, specials. He came back for Day of the Doctor. Paul McGann needs a run. He yeah. needs... Mm-hmm. I mean, this is assuming he would be up for it. He's probably got lots of other stuff on because he's always working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would he love to see him come back. Yeah, I feel like I it might it... just never happen. I don't know because RTD in the recent past has been talking about how the likes of Disney and other companies are creating these sort of multiverses, and he says that's what Doctor Who should be doing. We should have a tenth Doctor series. Mm. We should have a this series or that series. So why not have an eighth Doctor series? Maybe. I think it'd be great. I mean, it's working for like Star Wars now and other shows. And I guess Russell was a bit ahead of the curve when mm. he was doing all the spin offs uh-huh. and all this world building way back then. And mm. would it work now? I don't know. I'd love it. I would be well up for it. Yeah. See, I, I was in disagreement with uh, Russell T. Davis about that. And I was like, well, no, Doctor Who doesn't need to be that. It can just, you know, just focus on the main suit, you know. But actually, you know, it's just going, well, if we were to get a Paul McGann suit, it was like, yeah, go for it. You're totally right, RTD. I'm totally in agreement. Let's have a... I mean, I'm sure there will be a certain kind of fan who, no matter what you do, they're always going to want to pick fault with it. Because <laughs> they have a YouTube channel and they get lots of views for slagging it off. <clears throat> uh, yeah. I'd like to see. Uh, uh, I know last time <laughs> round we had Doctor Who, then you had Sarah Jane and Torchwood. But if you look mm-hmm. at how Disney Plus do their shows at the moment, there's basically yeah. a Star Wars series, then when that finishes, a Marvel series, then back to Star Wars. Yeah. So if you've got two series of Doctor Who a year, one is Doctor yeah. Who and one is Doctor Who Adventures. You know, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't just have to be a McGann. Imagine it. No. Like an anthology yeah, of different mm-hmm. people, maybe. You, yeah. ju- you know, do it as the, I don't know, the Torchwood Files or yeah. something. You know. So even if you're not enjoying the current version of Doctor Who, there's another one coming yeah. along that you might enjoy more. 
Yeah, and I'd say bring back. But they're all rubbish. Classics. I hate them all. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to watch them and moan about it. <laughs> yeah, I'd want them to bring bring all the classics back, but don't like de-age them or anything. Just keep them as they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if if it was an anthology, you could do it in different styles. You know, you could have a couple of animated yeah. episodes where. Yeah, you know, that'd be really it cool. Doesn't matter oh, yeah. that everybody's twenty, thirty years older. Yeah, there's ways around it. It would actually be. Re- I think it would be really, really nice if if this were to kick off and Colin Baker were fortunately still around to get him involved. Mm. That isn't to mm. you know uh, have you know sideline any of the other doctors, but you know given how because he's a very good actor and mm. you know he played the part incredibly well despite everything that was thrown at him. It would Indeed be really nice, is. you know. D- you know, have that opp- you know, have that opportunity for him to play the doctor again. Mm-hmm. He's he didn't deserve to be fired from that is, role. Yeah. yeah. No. Actually, the more I'm talking about, it, it's like, yeah, I want more to do. I'll make it happen. <laughs> well, it sounds like Matt's got a real handle on it. So, uh, if anyone from Bad Wolf is listening, um, he's available at uh, a reasonable rate. <laughs> Let's get Ardman involved, and we'll have stop animation, <laughs> claymation, Doctor Who. Oh my giddy aunt, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, so we've currently got a little bit of listener feedback. Um, mm-hmm. Before we get there, we're going to do some social reminders. But Mark, do you want to tell us about your podcast? Yeah, um, I have got a podcast called All of Time and Space. as myself and my friend Ian Martin. And we are watching all of Doctor Who in broadcast order. So we've started with An Unearthly Child. As we record this, we're about halfway through season four. So uh, that's quite an interesting time period for the show. And we have a revolving guest list. So uh, every episode we have someone different come in and give their thoughts on that particular story. And it's a lot of fun. We have a fun quiz and we have a bit of a chat and a laugh. And um, it's a nice way to spend an hour or so. So uh, that's our show. And you can find us on all the usual platforms. And we're on Twitter, uh, which is at Time N Space Pod. So what's coming up next for you? Uh, we, and the next one we're going to be recording is The Underwater Menace. Yeah. Mm. The music's just coming into my head now. <laughs> <laughs> Matt hasn't experienced that one yet, yeah. have you, Matt? No, yeah, that's the one for you to look forward to. And it has one of the best cliffhangers in a Doctor Who ever. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you love ridiculously over-the-top stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. Makes uh, Eric Roberts look rather sort of calm and... Uh, <laughs> Subdued. <laughs> reserved, yeah. yeah. Matt, do you want to tell us about your podcast? Yep. Yeah, so I am one of two hosts, along with my friend David, on Neither the Time Nor the Space. By the time I think this episode airs, we will have finished a four-year journey through all of New Who. We we recorded Eve of the Daleks today. We've just got Legend of the Sea Devils to go. Then we're finally caught up. No idea where we go from there. Um, (laughs) I'm actually a little bit scared, a little bit worried what we do next. Um, But as well as Doctor Who, it's just... Well, we've started referring it to a podcast about the banality of everyday life. So <laughs> I think this week we have a conversation about how overrated seaside rock is. <laughs> it's just, just the most overrated food in the world, just Scarborough rock. Um, yeah, just anything that enters our mind, we discuss. Not candy floss then. No, because the thing is, candy floss takes less effort to make. Imagine how hard it is to make a stick of rock that says... With words Yeah, and it says rock (laughs) all the way through it. And (laughs) no one enjoys it. (laughs) That's true, actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, So there we go. There's one of the little segues that we have. Very cool. Yeah, neither the time nor the space. It is time nor space pod on Twitter. I think Matt's probably too modest to uh, mention it himself, but he and David have raised crazy amounts of money for charity. Yes. Just so through... Uh... Every year, 
well, I say every year, we've done it twice. Uh, when we hit my birthday, so middle of October, between then and Christmas, we pick a charity, we do a weekly quiz, and people have been so, so, so generous. So in total, we've raised, I think, just over a thousand pounds over two quizzes. So That's for different charities for different years. Mm. That's really good. And it all it all good started as a joke. <laughs> 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 so. so should we get on to some listeners' responses? I think yeah, we'll have I'm some for say. Did we have some for you to read out? No, we Come didn't. On. We didn't. <laughs> Everyone knows the worst part of any podcast is listener feedback, listener tweets. But that's what you live for, Matt. No, just no, thank you. Can you not see any read out? Yeah, now? yeah. Right, Rob, I'm going to bestow a special job on you because whenever we do listener tweets on our pod, we always make them. I always make David say hello, so you can fulfil that role this week. Yeah, but David has like all week to do something great. Yeah. All, all you've got to do is say hello, Rob. Don't worry. No pressure. Like, I don't have like a banjo <laughs> or anything. Right. So the first message comes from Rod Henderson. Say hello, Rob. <sighs> hello, Rod. Okay. Uh, he says that the episode we're currently recording is the episode to hear. Uh. This episode is... Yeah, the one we're doing right now. We're living in the moment, Rob. Episode 100. (laughs) The place to be. We then got a message from... uh, Well, I don't know how they sent this because you've just been talking to them, Rob. Those who can convince you boys. Do you want to say hello? I mean, they're just over there. Why don't you wave at them? (laughs) What on about? Literally, you came in one door. They walked out the other. Uh, they like that. What the plan? <laughs> really helpful feedback. Yeah. This it just says we're sending this message just so Matt has to read it out. And then the final tweet comes from the Married to Who podcast. Say hello, Rob. Hello, Rob. Uh, great joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, in reference to a tweet we once got to referring uh, reviewing an episode, they've said I've never listened to Matt's podcast. I've never heard of it, and I can't watch Doctor Who where I live. So I've never seen it. <laughs> oh, that never gets old, and does uh, it? One, one week, every week, I put a message out saying, oh, this <laughs> week I'm reviewing The Five Doctors or whatever episode it is. If you've got any feedback, get in touch. You know, I'd love to hear what you say. Just one week, this person sent us a message just going, oh, I've never watched Doctor Who. I've never listened to your uh, podcast, so I can't really help you out here. <laughs> In fact, in fact, I can't get Doctor Who where I live. Right? <laughs> How was that possible? It's like those Amazon reviews, isn't it, where you get someone's been asked, oh, can you um, answer this person's question on this product? And they just go, no. I don't know, I've never bought <laughs> yeah. it. Well, thanks for that. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, um, but reviews like that always make me smile. <laughs> Is that it for the responses you've got? That, that's all from me. All right, I've got one here. Um, oddly enough, it's from it's from you, Matt. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Can you make Matt read his own out? Is this, that... is, this is worrying because I can't remember sending it. <laughs> it's getting very meta now. <laughs> the only Doctor Who I'd ever seen before started our pod. I vividly remember the ending, albeit more dramatically than it actually is. I remember it like I wish we had more of this incarnation of the Doctor and the weird evil snake wizard master. Yeah, I stand by that. Thanks for that, Matt. (laughs) Um, BT Flibberty Giggard. Do you want to say hello to him, Matt? Greetings, curator. The funniest thing is that Seven lands in San Fran gets shot in a gang war and winds up dying due to medical malpractice. As someone who has seven in their top three doctors, I'm going to say it right here. It's what he deserves. Wow. That's cold. That is really cold. Hmm. I always thought BT was one of the good guys. Not on this pod. Hmm. So... (laughs) <laughs> Alexander Grogan, 
Uh, Liam, do you want to say hello to him? Do I have to? Yeah, he's a big fan. All right, okay. Hello. <laughs> best theme of the classics, best TARDIS interior of the classics, one of the best classic doctors. Paul McGann mm. is an incarnation I say is the most like me as a doctor. What? Charming and dashing. Mm. B Bird Moth said, With Neil and I was on film four recently, and it got me thinking. Never has there not, will there never ever be a sexier doctor than Paul McGann? I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. He's a handsome chap. Like if Paul McGann fought Anthony Ainley. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Take your glasses, Steve. Do you want a moment, Matt? Yeah. 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 <laughs> a bit hard under the collar. <laughs> so Jason Thompson said Doctor Who was back. It was about time. The buzz around it. At the time was amazing. The steady drip feed of pictures, articles, special magazine issues, all building to the main event. It has a huge, unique style. No, it has a unique. <laughs> it has a unique style, being the only major '90s Who production. It looks like every other '90s drama series, but it still retains a lot of Who elements. Paul McGann is amazing as the Doctor in his one-hour screen time. The plot is weird, but okay. The TARDIS console is gorgeous. I really enjoyed watching it. But, oh, I think this is a, a three-tweeter. Wow. Um, It's a four-tweeter. Oh, no, wait a second. <laughs> it's a, it's a five-tweeter. Is it an essay? Matt is not happy no. about this. He's very, so, he so limits it tweets, just so. one. One okay. tweet and out. Just read the first tweet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's the last one though. but I remember a lot of criticism in the time of the Americanization of Doctor Who looking back now I don't think it's terribly valid criticism beyond being set in America there isn't a lot to see apart from other shows in Who history of course the big controversy uh, was America getting it before we did and the VHS coming out before it was broadcast so tempting to get it but I resisted and the toning down of the gun violence in the woke of Dunblane now I absolutely love it and it kicked off an awesome era with the Eighth Doctor, even if a series never did materialise. Paul McGann nails it. The scene where he holds himself at gunpoint is just superb. That sounds like everything I've been saying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did I not write that? We could have just read that out and went home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could have read that and went, went that's what Liam thinks, bye. Uh, <laughs> we did a poll. Oh. Good, bad, or average. Mm-hmm. Um, um, a modest 53 votes so how do you think it fed it's got to be good isn't it yeah. surely it was good I, I don't For... if, if there's one thing you can't say about this is that it's average it's well, up and down the whole way um, <laughs> it's 47% good oh. 42% average 11% bad oh so most people liked it, and some people really liked it. So as a conclusion, has anyone got any final words to say about the movie? I've got a lot of love for it. I don't know if I'd go as far as to say it's good or great, but I've got a lot of love for it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a fun watch. Um, there's a certain nostalgia about watching it back again. It takes you back to where you were in your, that place in your life. It's a lot of fun rewatching it. Yeah. And he's a great doctor, so what's not to like? Oh, well, uh, I just want to say a big thanks for joining us for the 100th. Well, thank yeah, you very much for inviting us. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming for the rehearsal, Matt, as well. My, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> he's such a pro. Yeah. Um, I'm going to um, put the kettle on. And, okay, so, Matt, you can join us for the first bonus episode... Mark, if you want to nick off, nip off to the shops, go to Pound Zone, oh, get yeah. some biscuits, and you can catch yeah, up with top us up on in some part two creams. of the teen biscuits in the cloister room. Lovely. Um, Look forward to it. Um, so I'm going to put the kettle on now. not working.
<laughs> oh, I forgot to plug it in. Ah, uh, schoolboy error. Hey. Hey. The TARDIS cloister bell. Imminent disaster. The cloister bell? Yes. What's that? Well, it's a sort of communications device reserved for wild catastrophes and sudden calls to man the battle stations. That's the cloister bell. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really terribly significant. The cloister bell? Oh, no.